Good day, everybody. Welcome to Bardcast, episode 11, where, as you probably know by now, every other Sunday, we peer behind the mask and ask, who was that masked man or group of Renaissance avatar-like geniuses? Today is January 10th, 2021, of the slightly improved but still slightly off Gregorian calendar and my very special guest today is Peter Bull and instead of giving you the usual obligatory canned bio I'm actually going to read what he sent us because you get more insight into him from the style of his writing than from the bio content itself he calls it the Peter Bull no holds barred bio I love this age one through seven raised in an unheated unheated house on 150 acres of east midlands clay i can relate except for the 150 acres part our house was unheated peter bloody horrible isn't it oh, growing up in england i tell you age seven to 13 <laughs> banished to a boarding school in northamptonshire age 13 to 18, relocated to similar in Shakespeare's own county. 1981 to 84, the student. Down to Devon on the pretext of geography. More time spent gaining intimacy with the local geomorphology than that to be found in books. 1984 to 94, the romantic years. Traveled a bit, drove a taxi. <laughs> Installed double glazing. I remember when I read this, it reminded me, Peter, I haven't had more than maybe one job outside of music in my life, and it was selling double glazing. And I remembered it when I read this. I thought, oh my God. And I think I did it for about a month. And oh, that's hard. You're going door to door knocking on the door. So being me, I decided to do it differently. I, I wasn't going to do the knocking on the door thing. Well, you still have to knock on the door because, but they always just tell you, you know, piss off. We don't want any. So, <laughs> so I, I turned it into an act 
And I, I swear to God, this is absolutely true. You can check it in the Akashic Records when you're back home. I would, <laughs> outside going, I would sing, double glazing, double glazing. It's amazing, it's amazing what glazing can do. And then they'd laugh, and then they'd still tell me to piss off. So um, it didn't work out. Peter, maybe you can tell us a bit about that. I'm dying to hear how it went. Installed double glazing. <clears throat> Made for... <laughs> <laughs> made further investigations of Devonian cliffs and crags. One of my favourite pastimes. Lugged a lot. <laughs> I hope he's as funny live as he is in his bio. Lugged a large format camera around the countryside to little effect. Attempted to self-educate, but fell head over heels in love with Sigmund Freud. And when things got really intense, caught a nasty dose of SD. Ooh, sounds awful. Shakespeare doubt. That's what that is. Wrote the great Freud novel, had the great Freud novel rejected by some of the finest publishing houses in the realm. Been there with you on that too. Good. 94 to 2005, family matters. Packed my bags and went off in a sulk to Constantinople. <laughs> Taught English, fell in love, got married on the billows of the Bosphorus, went south, started a family beside the sunny Mediterranean Sea. Shakespearean disease became more apparent as it progressed to the secondary incurable stage. Yes, that, that will happen. 2005 to 2020, money matters. Decamped to the Emirate of Sharjah, not sure how you pronounce that, but a stone's throw from the glittering jewel of Dubai, where he joins us today, on the Arabian Gulf, where the streets are paved with gold of sable hue, to seek my fortune and a cure. Taught, teaching still, English in a little academy, still seeking the said streets, sense of geography, not the best, and now marvelously distempered and delusional with the Shakespeare itch. So, damsels and knights, in the order of the Bard cast, I present to you, without further ado about anything, my new friend, Peter Paul. Hello, Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's a great privilege to be on the Bard cast. I've been, uh, been following you since you started with oh. the, uh, the two Michaels, every, every episode I've watched. Wow. And... Uh, it was only last summer, actually, that I first actually got wind of what you were up to. Um, I got put onto your work by uh, a contact at the Shakespeare Auth Authorship Trust, and I was amazed when I started looking at your videos. I thought, wow, there is someone who actually knows what they're talking about when it comes to <laughs> the mysteries of the sonnets, someone who studied them and found things which I never dreamt would be there. Hmm. Um, your analysis of the geometry and the ratios, those um, right angle triangles on the cover of the sonnets, literally blew my mind because I've been studying the sonnets for so long and I didn't even look at the cover page, quite honestly. I looked at the dedication, spent hours and hmm. years on that, and I just kind of discounted it because it just seemed like a casual jumble mm. as all other readers do yeah um <clears throat> well i had to you know i mean it's only once when you decide you go i wonder what's here but normally you can be looking at things forever and never see things that are quite you know what do they say hidden in plain sight <laughs> yeah and thanks to you i actually took a second look at the cover mm. and some of the things i, I like to show this evening or it's evening here it's probably daytime with you um <laughs> they all come from the cover and it, you know it is quite amazing what's hidden in the words let alone the, the full stops and the lines oh, um, the words were so carefully put together mm -hmm. um it's a lot of hidden information in there and yeah. uh wow can't wait know, yeah excited to see that it's really nice to have someone to share these things with 
because I've kind of been ploughing a lone furrow with my own work, which is uh, mainly in Gematria. Um, mm. And I haven't really met anyone with a detailed depth knowledge of kind of the esoteric side of the sonnets. Somebody you know? without a life, you mean? Exactly. Right. Someone as boring as me who just Someone locked just... themselves away. And... Yeah. Yeah, there's not, <laughs> and not just... many. <laughs> <laughs> well, sad, lonely people. <laughs> <clears throat> well, thank you for that. I felt the same. I'm going to talk a little bit about about that because of how you uh, approached me in the first place. You might be asking. Uh, I mean, you said that you mentioned the SAT Shakespeare Authorship Trust. Who was it that? Who was it that? It was Julia you? Julia Cleave. Oh, okay. I don't know if you know her. I, I don't know her that well because mm. I've only joined the trust quite recently. But I don't um, know. Her. Very nice I mean, lady. I heard her name, but yeah, and she um, she heard you speaking. I think it's a Tenemos Foundation or something like that. You went there. You gave a talk, I think, about the um, about the cover and the and the geometry. That oh, it must have been the Devere there. Society. Oh, Alexander right. Wars De Devere Society. Okay. Yeah, and she said that. Um, people were just spellbound by, uh, by what you oh, showed Oh, I them. don't know if they all were. <laughs> well, she was. Anyway. <laughs> I'll tell you, actually, since you bring that up, I don't mean to cut you off, but about that spellbound, here's what was actually happening. Um, so Derek Jacobi was there, and that was the first time I'd met him. He was a charming, just wonderful, engaging person, and he had, he introduced himself uh, to me, which was a surprise. And he just, <coughs> and I was a bit, you know, flummoxed for words, to be honest, because he's one of my heroes in in the whole Shakespearean world. And. Um, so, but here's the point, because he was there and he was in the front row, I could, I mean, you say everyone was enthralled. I, I, it's always, it's always a mix, right? There are people who are for it. There are people who are open to codes and anagrams and hidden messages. And there are people who are absolutely vehemently don't want to hear anything about it because that complicates their job and their life, right? Oh God, we don't want to go there. We've got a hard enough time convincing everybody that Shakespeare's not Shakespeare. Please don't, right? You know that <clears throat> where the Baconians went. Uh, turns out they were right too, though. But I mean, I'm just saying, you know, that was they yeah. were tarred with a terrible brush because of um, well, uh, easy shots, right? Easy shots. Oh, because uh, Delia Bacon went mad and ended up in a nut house, right? Oh, well, that's, we can use that. <laughs> the Stratfordians <laughs> will use, use that. Oh, yes, you'll go mental if you start questioning Shakespeare. Uh, J. Thomas Loney, poor fellow, uh, cursed with the name Looney. I mean, it's just such a low blow. It's, it's worse than modern day politics. It's just like, oh, <laughs> Looney, of course he's, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we can't take him seriously. The start of the Oxfordian movement, right? A hundred years ago, last year. <clears throat> and so the audience is split. There are actually people sitting there cringing. Not groaning, but wow. cringing. I could feel yeah. it. I could see it. And there were some who were absolutely all for it. But the thing is, Derek Jacobi was in the front row. And Derek Jacobi gave my presentation a standing ovation. And so they all had to yeah. follow suit. <laughs> 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 they had to. <laughs> what are they going to do? Sit there on their asses while, while Sir Derek is cheering. So it was delightful. <laughs> anyway, well done, carry on. Yeah. I just had to just mention that because I'm quite sure you know uh, uh, Julia was one of those who was engaged. That's good. <laughs> right. Oh, she oh, she was, and uh, yeah. I mean, she's she's done some of her own research. I, and she sent me a few of her, her articles, um, looking at the more esoteric side of things, mm -hmm. um, because uh, she, she's looked a little bit into 
um, Freemasonry and, and Shakespeare and connections between the two of them. Mm. And uh, that was my pretext originally for approaching her and emailing her and uh, pointing out that, you know, I'd done a one little study about Antony and Cleopatra and looking at the esoteric content of that and pointing out that that would seem to indicate some connection with uh, esoteric threads of knowledge and uh, interests. Sure. Um, so I, I pointed her to that article of mine and, and she sent some to me and when we got talking and then she said, had you heard about Alan Green? I said, no, who's he? And then uh, you know, I, I followed up on that and uh, then I think I I wrote to you some non-committal sort of email and got a non-committal one back. And then I sort of I was thinking about how can I engage him a little bit. Ah yes, um, well you found the right way to do that. I did. I, <laughs> you I gave a bit of a prod. <laughs> you accused me of. I mean, it wasn't that way. I'm going to talk about it actually because I, I was okay. thrilled. But go ahead. You, what's your version of it, Peter? <laughs> Well, you know, I, I've, I've got all my research stuff and I've got lots of facts and files and things. I can quite easily check things. Um, mm. So I, I think it was something to do with the speed of light, I'm not sure, um, and references to the sun in different sonnets. And was. <laughs> adding up the numbers mm. of those sonnets and <laughs> dividing pi by six and things like that and and lo and behold the speed of light was coming out mm. i think you would correct me if i'm wrong but it was no. roughly that kind of thing yeah um, but you were very specific and i don't know if you remember but i, I want to hear yeah. because i i'm gonna i'm gonna show everybody because it's it's a fabulous story but yeah go ahead. yeah um basically it was on references to the sun i think it was yeah it was exactly and that and you yeah. You were saying that there were something, I don't know, there were 10 or 11 or something. And I thought, hmm, let me have a check up on that. So I <laughs> do, a, do a little search and, oh, look, I found an extra one. <clears throat> Alan hasn't seen that. He's wrong. He We've got him. He's wrong. Busted. Yeah. Nailed him. <laughs> or, or, or at least um, able to provoke him into... Getting a, oh, like a, a response, getting him to notice me. Um, <clears throat> so, well, it kind of worked. It worked because I wrote this slightly cheeky email to you, and I got about a three pages back of detailed explanation. I thought, wow, that is just incredible. You spent that much time and gone to so much trouble to set out exactly how it all worked and fitted together and why this extra sum that I found wasn't included in that specific total. Yeah. No, it's not that. It's just that I'm really touchy. And I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's just, I'll show him. No, <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I, I just, this is me. I go through this with Alejandro all the time. I cannot, I can't, if I see an opening for a joke, Boom, I'm through there, and then I regret it. I am going to tell the people, I'm going to tell everybody um, what what um, what went down, because it's actually one of the best experiences I've ever had in terms of getting response and then writing back. Uh, and then, of course, what's resulted. We are, we've become friends through it, and here you are on the show. Um, it's not everyone that well, A, would see uh, what you saw anyway. And when I say not everyone, I mean one in 10 to 15 million might. And I'm really serious about that because you know your stuff. And so when you, oh, let's, let's, let's go, let's get into it. I'm going, where is it? <laughs> I'll show you what you sent. <clears throat> it's really fun. <laughs> Alright, so here's, here's the first comment that attracted my attention. Peter Bull says, how does the number of the sun from references in the sonnets equal 740 and 765 at the same time? 
<coughs> if you say sums in sonnet 25 doesn't count for the lower total, then it shouldn't count in sonnet 33. Second occurrence, either. And I'm thinking, God, this guy knows his stuff. He's, it says, he even knows it's the <coughs> second occurrence in sonnet 33. I mean, you all know that. I mean, all you out there in Bardcast land, I know, I mean, we, we know this. <clears throat> no, Peter Jones, he says, it looks like you are fudging it, Alan. And I thought, Oops. no, 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 it was, it was perfect. It was, please, honestly, compared to some of the trolls that I get, <laughs> this was, this was positively an invitation to a dance. <laughs> it was like, well, I have people writing saying, of course, if you put enough dots on a piece of paper, you'll get triangles, you stupid idiot. So uh, this was a very, very polite, and he just suggested that I was fudging because he knew. And I knew that he knew, and I was just thrilled that you knew, because, as I am about to explain, what Peter's referencing there, Sonnet 33, has three references to sun. Even so, my sun, one early morn, did shine with all triumphant splendor on my brow. Now, okay, now, but the brilliant thing about this is it's, it's very, obviously, it's the basis for a mathematical revelation, which we're going to get into later on Peter's side of, of it. What he's shown me in, in Gematria just blows my mind equally. There's that mathematics there, and yet at the same time, there's this, this poetic message coming through. Um, stealing, s stealing, what does it actually say there behind the word stealing? Stealing, seen, uh, I should know this and I'm foxing myself now. Stealing something to west with this disgrace, even so my son, one early morn did shine with all triumphant splendor on my brow. I mean, if you hear somebody saying, my son, my son, <laughs> that's probably a subtle reference to paternity. Anyway, but out alack, he was but one hour mine. Oh, his son was but one hour mine. So I know that this is talking about, or at least I, my hypothesis is, among many others, I'm not the only person to think this, of course. The region cloud hath masked him from me now. Now, if this is the queen having a child with the writer, then you've got, there's no way she can acknowledge it. The region cloud, the regent cloud masked him from me now. He was only, he was only mine for an hour. It's heartbreaking, and this occurs in many, many of the sonnets. Anyway, but the point is, Peter's spotting this. He goes, so there's another one. Sons of the world may stain. Well, again, that's not talking about, that's talking about sons of the world. Sons. It should be S-O-N-S, but he's still spelt S-U-N-S because he's going to tell us something mathematically about the sun, and yet at the same time he's getting a message across about, through poetic poetically about another message that he wants to be getting through and then he says sons of the world may stain when heaven's sun staineth hmm. okay so that heaven's sun is probably a, a star right we're a planet the earth a star. you know maybe he's talking about the sun there but maybe he's also got a double meaning so anyway the point is peter spots this and i know <clears throat> I said to I, I said to you actually I think in the first response before I actually sent you the long explanation I said I've been waiting for someone like you to show up I'm expecting it for years because I think the part that I wrote of the mathematics about that is about eight years ago and and uh, the the thing is this you cannot what I'm going to show you is I used to think, not for the general public audience. Uh, it's enough to try to get a certain thing across. You know this, Peter. Um, you know, you've got to spoon feed a bit by bit by bit. And I don't mean that 
in, in a detrimental way or accusative way at all. It's just the way it is. It's a massive amount of information. And people have to just get, okay, let me absorb that and see how that is. What, what, is, what is going on here? <clears throat> so I was delighted because, as I said to you, I said, I said, look, it's going to take far too long to try to even answer in a comment. Please write to me. And I gave you my personal uh, email and said, just, just write to me and so that we can communicate. And we did. And that's when I sent you the, the long explanation. And I'm not going to go through all of the math in it right now, but I am going to show you essentially uh, at home, you people watching what this is about, because you are not the ordinary general public audience. You're engaged. You are making really intelligent and deep observations about everything that's happening in these broadcasts. And I know you'll have the same to say about today's. And when once you see Peter's work, it's just going to blow your mind. So this is what Peter was aware of that most people are not aware of, right? There's all these sonnets that say the word sun. And Sonnet 33 has the word sun in it twice there in terms of singular sun. Spelt differently, but singular. But then there's also suns, plural, in Sonnet 33 as well. Now, <clears throat> as I said, it doesn't refer to suns, stars, but suns of the world. Can't, can't be referring to the sun, it just says suns of the world. And then, <clears throat> here they are, 33, 33, and 33. But then there's this other sonnet, 25, in which there's another variant, sons, possessive. It says, um, that there's actually no apostrophe written in it, but the possessive meaning clearly keeps it separate. It says, great prince's favourites, their fair leaves spread, but as the marigold at the sun's eye, the eye of the sun, the sun's eye. So it's talking about the sun, yes, but again, there's that poetic aspect of it. The great princes, this is royalty. Elizabeth was thought of as the sun and the moon, and of course... That's all well documented. And so here you've got this reference to, they're like, like, they're like flowers that open under the sun's rays. Oh, you've praised me, thank you. I'm, I'm important. But if she frowns on you, that's all gone. You know? And in themselves, their pride lies buried, for at a frown they in their glory die. He's talking about <laughs> court <laughs> espionage <laughs> and the politics that's going on. So it's sons, possessive, but there's no apostrophe. But the other interesting thing about it, um, you'll see there, it's a, what's called a medial S. It looks like an F. This is why these old documents are hard to read if you're not used to reading uh, them in the original. And you've got to read them in the original, or, or otherwise all the mathematics and all the depth of the coding is gone because it's been changed. Sun's eye. So it looks like an F, but it's also italic. You notice that the, but only the S is italic. The rest of the word, sun's eye, is not italic. It's standing out. It's italicized to draw attention. It's got a medial S to draw attention to it. It's different. It's showing you there's a, there's a difference. And so <clears throat> if you count all the plain single suns, it's, uh, it had all the, you, you're just adding up the sonnet numbers. That's all we're doing here. 21 plus 24 plus 33 plus 33 plus 3 adds up to 740. And then if you include the sons possessive, but you're not dealing with plurals, then your total is 765. Now what Peter is, is making reference to here is a presentation that I've given, I do not know when, I've given it a few times, but this is about speed of light and the Shakespeare equation that I, I've, I've named it and it's all to do with you know how many times does he have the word light or speed or sun or earth or moon or distance or pyramid 
in the sonnets and then you find out what the sonnet numbers are. And so in this case, we've got uh, the first thing that I looked for was, okay, I, now I don't know where this came from because it's a kind of an out there thing to think, but I remember vividly in 2012 thinking, he's embedded the speed of light in the sonnets. I had no evidence for it at all, but I just knew it as clear as day. And I, I then thought, well, the obvious way he would do it is speed. How many times does he use the word speed? Well, here's me on a camel, <clears throat> first time in Egypt. The angle of the Great Pyramid is 51.843, but in terms of the way they would measure it in, back in the day, 51 degrees and then 50 slash 51 minutes. So it's 50, they would say it's 51, 50, 51. Well, speed occurs in these summits, 50 and 51, 51 twice and 50 once. And that's kind of suspicious. So wh what about light? Ooh, how many times does he use the word light? Well, Hmm. And so, when you put all the light sonnets together, you've got a list of those numbers. Now, looking for pyramid, he only says pyramid in one sonnet, but it's perfect. One, two, three. <laughs> it's the first triangular number. Pyramid. One, two, three. And then, knowing that there, you, if you're, de you're dealing with mathematics at all, you have to be involving pi and Pi is all based around this, which everybody is pretty much aware of. I don't need to go into great length uh, explaining this, but the diameter of the Earth equated to the base of a pyramid. Then you've got the height of the pyramid is the radius of the Earth plus the radius of the Moon. That's a well-known fact. And one good way for you to think of the mathematics of this, at least it helped me, uh, because I'm not naturally a trained mathematician. I've always enjoyed math in school, but I've had to teach myself a lot of the math uh, as I went along with this because of where I could see it was going. I had to learn about calculus and trigonometry to understand what he was doing. Um, so if you have a circle of radius one, then your circumference is two pi. If you cut that pi in half, <coughs> you've got one pi is half the circle. You cut it into six slices, and you've got a sixth, one sixth of pi, which Peter referenced. It's a slice of pi. But the, the importance of that is that the radius is the meter and the arc is the cubit. So that's a, an inherent inbuilt relationship. And to convert cubits, royal cubits, to meters, you multiply by pi over six, which reduces to 0.524. And that, I was realizing, well, that's what we're going to call the Shakespeare equation, because he always, always does it, no matter what he's calculating. So, for instance, there's only one sonnet that has the word distance in it, sonnet 44. Here are the moon sonnets, here are the earth sonnets, here are the sun sonnets. And what Peter was rightly nudging me about was that, why aren't you using sonnet 25? You know. I could get by and just do it without that, and no one was going to see it. And I was waiting eight years for somebody to see it. Then I could explain it. But so, rather than go that deep into it, which would have everyone's eyes would have glazed over, and people would have started going, "Oh, I can't." You know, it's easy to just say he knows the distance Earth to Sun. It, you know, it's just easier to say that. Only when so clever <laughs> somebody clever like peter comes along and you finally have to go all right all right but i was thrilled because i got to explain it then say oh thank god somebody understands it now i can tell him it's even more brilliant than you thought it was because he's looking at that saying well i was 25 and you've used all the three of 33 33 and and why aren't you using 25 and quite right too so 
if we use the sun singular and plural and don't use the possessive one, then you've got that total, which is the total that I was using in that calculation to just give you the simple distance Earth to Sun. But we know there's no single one distance Earth to Sun, right? But just to show you how it all works, in case people haven't seen this, some of you have seen bits of this. Speed of light. Speed of light. It's a fraction. A quarter of something would have the four on the bottom and the one on the top, wouldn't it? So speed of light. Just make it like that. You put them together like that. That gives you a number. And you have the the, the answer doesn't make sense until you realize, wait a minute, maybe he's working in qubits. And maybe I have to multiply by this particular little device he's using because it's pyramid. Multiply by 1, 2, 3, multiply by pi over 6, and it gives you the speed of light in meters per second. So accurately that it's it's kind of mind-boggling. It's 99.84% accurate. Put That's, you know, to put it into perspective, um, the Greeks... <clears throat> prior to 1600, and going way back, everyone thought that speed of light was infinite. Just, that's it. you see it instantly. And then Shakespeare comes along and embeds this in the sonnets in 1609. And then, eh, 66 years later, Roma comes along and gets all the accolades for doing his experiment about the Venus transit and says he's discovered the speed of light. I've converted it to meters. He, they didn't know meters then, but still, it's according to his calculations, he, he was 73.39% accurate. So over 25% off, but he goes down in history as the guy that discovered the speed of light. All right. It takes another 100 years before Foucault gets much closer, 99.3% accurate, in 1862. Einstein, in 1905, is still using Foucault's measurements. Imagine that. He's using a number that is not quite accurate, 99.3%, while he's beginning to work on general relativity. Rosa and Dorsey come along in 1907, and that's the first time we get a value of the speed of light that's more accurate than Shakespeare's. 99.999% accurate, 1907. And then the International System of Measurements validates it and ties it all together with a nice red bow and says meter and it's all they're interdependent because we now understand Einstein's space-time continuum and they say it's 299792458 meters per second and always will be. But that's the history of it, and yet, imagine, Shakespeare, if this is right, right, I might just be a nutcase, and I, I just made this thing up, and the numbers just happened to match. <clears throat> but if it's right, Shakespeare was actually intuitively knowledgeable about the speed of light, more, better than the number that Einstein was using 300 years later. But for that to make sense, for that to be real, this pyramid and slice of pie thing, which I'm calling the Shakespeare equation, has to work across various platforms. It's got to work some other way. So I test out Earth and Moon and distance and you get that multiplied by the Shakespeare equation. And it's the distance Earth to Moon to 99.9% .9 accuracy. And then here's the one that got Peter's knickers in a twist. Sun to Earth. <laughs> it's like, okay, Look at that. Isn't that fabulous? He's 99.4% accurate. Peter goes, not having that. We're not having that. You've missed. <laughs> He's quite right. And I was just thrilled. I went, oh, thank God. Somebody's got it. <clears throat> because now I can explain in detail. Yes, it's 99.4% accurate for the average distance Earth to Sun. Because we all know now that it's an average distance. We call it the mean. And it's called this very important thing called the astronomical unit. So one astronomical unit is the average distance Earth to Sun. But then, according to the orbit, look, you've got these two other values. Perihelion, when it's nearest to the Sun, and aphelion, when it's furthest away from the Sun. And now the magic. You get, okay, so suns, when that is 
Oh, that's right. That's what did we say it was? Sons of the world. If he's talking about his son who has the frown of the regent on him and he's not going to be recognized and he's the son but he's as far away as he can be and he can't be king that's really analogous poetically to the aphelion he's as far away from the son as he can be the son son s-u-n the royal son he is the s-o-n so it made sense to me that oh that's what he's doing and when you put aphelion when you put the sons the plural one into the equation then he's given you the actual value of the aphelion to 99.2 percent whereas if you use sons possessive what does possessive mean belonging to nearest to i'm possessing you the possessive sons apostrophe s may this look to it because of the the medial s that's possessive that's poetically it obviously means the perihelion when you incorporate that then you've got that and you've got <laughs> so i was so delighted to get to be able to show peter that simply because he's the only other person on the planet who would get it and now you've all got it and i am excited by <laughs> that because that's the truth of it you see if they'd just given us one 400 years later they'd have thought oh somebody will eventually stumble on this maybe and and uh, but by then they'll know very well there's no, yeah, there's, there's no one distance earth to sun right so and that could just be therefore a complete fluke but if i include possessive and if i include sun sun far away sun plural sun and they get that all these are have poetic meaning that relate to aphelion, perihelion, and mean, and they're all spot on, then it validates the code. Far more than just one value. So to me, that was something that I was waiting to do. I thought maybe nobody will ever, ever even ask. Thank you, Peter, for asking. I really, you're the only person that would would get it but again you see by by doing that we now get to share it and the world can begin to understand it's the oh the four minute mile has been broken now everybody can break the four minute mile oh we've landed on the moon we can get to the moon it's that paradigm shift that happens in consciousness so i hope that a little bit of that has happened for all of you at home peter Thank you. Thank you, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, it's such a good point about the, the confirmation by having a pattern and having a sequence of things which fit together to make, to confirm that you're on the right, um, yeah. on the right wavelength. Yeah. Because, I mean, that's something that I'm working with in, 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 in my work with Gematria, is that all sorts of numbers appear by random. It's only when there's a consistent pattern that you know that you're on the right track. Exactly. Th this is where some kind of amateur people fall down and one or two of the people that have been looking for Baconian signs, I'm not saying everyone, but one or two of them, they see one number and they say, yes, I can see that number and that means bacon. And it doesn't unless there's a consistency about it, mm -hmm. unless there's a reason for thinking that that's bacon. Mm -hmm. um, or, or whatever. Yeah. Uh, random numbers are random. Mm -hmm. They don't mean anything. They're going to appear everywhere. It's just it's the the patterning and the consistency yeah. that that provides a confirmation, um, and that's what you've got to look out for. I agree and, uh, entirely. I have resisted, you know, as you know, I've resisted. Gamatri, I've told you this when we started talking on Zoom, mm. <clears throat> because for that very reason. Oh, there's this method and there's that method and there's that method and that method. And it seems so random to me. And yet I knew that John D was the most learned Hebrew scholar of his time, that he must have embedded Gematria. There's no doubt about it. But I just thought, I can't go down that rabbit hole. I honestly thought, you know, uh, because I have great faith in, in the divine nature of things. I just thought mm -hmm. the divine knows I don't have time to do that. 
uh, he, she, it will send me someone who can. <laughs> and my prayers were answered. Because um, it, it requires that. I mean, you've put what, 30, you're going to tell us all, but I know you've said 30, 32 years into this. It's, 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 it's a massive, I, I knew I could never go there. I'm not going to go there. I've got, I've got other battles to fight. And, but we're all part of the solution. You bring value. Others bring value. We've got to be open to each other and not predatory and, oh, I found this first and you got me. I mean, it's, it's a lot of that politics, even in this like, tiny little niche world of who's solving the Shakespeare mystery. Because it's such a, a big goal, isn't it? It's, it's the golden ring. Yeah. If you actually uh, could solve it. Wow. Yeah. So that's what, her, that's what uh, has absolutely uh, and convinced me of what you what you showed me and what you're going to show today i know um but i'm just giving it a bit of a boost and i'm dancing around it a bit because that's the way i am <laughs> that's my ex-wives so um you know it's like oh alan why can't you just come out and just say you've discovered such and such you know why does it have to be a big production why do you have to bring the violin section in why do we have to <laughs> well i don't know i just like to be theatrical and set it up so i'm trying to set the stage for you peter because you uh, because you're going to bring us some some news that will add to that um so let me see we've got hmm yeah um well well let's go let's let's go into it because you're bound you're chafing at the bit and i know you've probably got an awful lot to to share with us so we we want to find out what it is i just want to share one thing with you though again to set it up with a bit of a flourish to me the idea that john d and I'm absolutely convinced it's John Dee because his signature is all over it, but I'm also now equally convinced that Bacon is assisting him all over the place as well. In terms of the encryption, I'm saying. They were both leaders of the Rosicrucian movement. So you end up with, <clears throat> he's got codes in the gravestone. If anybody hasn't seen a previous podcast called the, you know, the World's First crossword puzzle look at it because the gravestone itself is just a massive massive ridiculous crossword puzzle of of codes and then you've got something very similar in the monument the shakespeare monument at stratford it has its own inbuilt coded system that's telling you something else and then the sonnet's dedication has its own inbuilt system that's telling you something else but what d and the angels did was then you put all those three together and put those 624 characters into the 624 spaces of the Enochian tables and that's giving you this message this way that way and turn it upside down that way it's inhuman right that in itself is divine and so therefore it de deserves to be said it's a 10 right 10 the divine number that's a level 10 I get to talk to you and you take it to a whole other level and you say, yeah, yeah, uh, how about this? This goes up to 11. <laughs> so I'm going to play you this short video so that everybody understands. Uh, I, I put it into the little promo at the beginning, but only a snippet of it. If you've never seen the film um, Spinal Tap, check it out. It's, it's really hysterical. And here's a clip from it that gives you the idea of what I'm talking about, of the fact that... We're going now today on podcast 11 to level 11. This is a top to, uh, you know, what we use on stage, but it's very, very special because if you can see, yeah, the numbers all go to 11. Look, right across the board, oh. 11, oh, 11, and most of 11, and then amps go up to 10. Exactly. Does that mean it's louder? Is it any louder? Well, it's one louder, isn't it? It's not 10. You see, most most blokes, you're going to be playing at 10. You're on 10 here, all the way up, all the way up, yeah. all the way up. You're on 10 on your guitar. Where can you go from there? Where? I don't know. Nowhere, exactly. What we do is if we need that extra push over the cliff, you know what we do? Uh, put it up to 11. 11, exactly. One louder. Why don't you just make 10 louder and make 10 be the top? 
number and make that a little louder. These go to 11. <laughs> you just can't beat British humour, can you? That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> All right, over to you, Peter. The stage is yours. Knock us out. Oh, okay. Um, well, I've got a, a couple of uh, slideshows um, to show. Um, the first one is related to kind of where I started out. Um, and I, from Freud, I got the message and I very quickly picked up on it that there was something hidden there. And I went straight into the sonnets and I thought this is, this is pretty autobiographical. How on earth is he in, encoded um, some sort of secret message here? And, you know, I thought uh, Ganache would be the way to, way to go. Um, so I started investigating it. Um, and there, it, it, back in antiquity, the numbers were much more highly regarded and used in different ways. And this is from St. Augustine, but it could have been from Pythagoras or Plato or anyone. Numbers are the universal language. Um, universal because they're the same in Dubai, LA, China, Outer Mongolia, South America, on the moon, on Mars, on Zeta Reticuli, they don't alter anywhere. Um, and so it's quite a powerful means of communication. And also it can work like a language, they can communicate quite sophisticated things. And you know, this is the language of the creator. It's look underneath the cover and the creation of anything. Um, there are patterns of numbers, there's geometry, the, all the, the marvels that, um, that Robert Grant's finding out. Um, it's all regular, it's all organized, and it's, it's very powerful. Um, and quite early on in history, people started using the alphabet um, for counting. There were, prior to that, number systems. Um, but when you use the alphabet as numbers, then words have values. And you can communicate uh, a numerical message as, as well as a, a sort of linguistic message. Um, and that, that has been going on for at least 4,000 years. In fact, longer than that, but this is the first clear, um, most obvious use of it. Um, so uh, Gamacha is assigning meaning to words based on their numerical value and on connections between words of equal value. Um, there seems to be a missing word there. I wonder what what that would be, assigning well, secret meaning, because it's hidden, it's cryptographic um, or mystical or there's some power in it, whatever, uh, it, you don't see it unless you know about it. Um, so that makes it interesting um, and useful. Um, it, the word derives from geometria, geometry, uh, which is a big hint about the way it's used um, because geometry provides the grammar of the language, provides a structure that shows how the numbers very often relate in patterns which are geometric. Um, so that's kind of where it comes from. It's kind of bounced between Greek and Hebrew um, Gematria is a Hebrew word from the Greek, and there's a lot of debate whether the Greeks or um, the Jews were using Gematria first um, to encode hidden meanings in, in their sacred texts. Um, 
and they, they both were basically, and it's perhaps a bit futile to, to ask who was going first. Um, and it, grammatia is, is possibly a, another partial source of the word knowledge of writing, um, skill of writing. Okay, so that's where it comes from. Um, okay, so in, in Hebrew, there's a 22 letter alphabet and it goes from Aleph 1 to Tov uh, 22. That's what I call the short code. I don't know. It's a basic code. But a rather more useful code or rather more used code is what I call the long code. And it's kind of got tiers. It's got the units up to nine, it's got tens up to 90, and then it's got some hundreds. Um, there aren't quite enough letters in the alphabet. So uh, rather later on, um, in the last thousand years or so, I don't know when, like, 1300, they added a few extra, um, which were these letters when they come at the end of a word, they get a higher value um, from Kafi to Sadi. And please forgive my Hebrew pronunciation, I don't really do Hebrew. Um, but that, that makes it like a complete system. Um, in Greek, it's the same picture as 24 letter alphabet. And to make the long code, they needed to add three letters, um, digamma at six, copper at 90, and sampi at 900. Um, those grayed out uh, values don't appear in writing, but only when the alphabet was used, the letters were used for counting. Okay, um, so, yeah? Momentary, let me just say that your voice is, is sort of fading out occasionally so i'm just wondering if it's because you're maybe turning away from the microphone to look at well, I, I i don't know but if if you can be aware of that we just l are losing you a couple of times it sounds sort of oh. as though you're turning away if that's the case just be cognizant of that thanks okay i'll try and, try and hold the mic a bit, a bit further out okay so um these are the, the classical languages and obviously, uh, Shakespeare is writing in English. Oh, hold on. Arabic does the same, basically. Um, very similar to Hebrew, and that was used for count too. Now, English, um, 24 letter alphabet, as we all know, well, in Shakespeare's day anyway, and before, um, the letters I and J were the, counted as being the same, and U and V were counted as the same. Um, and this code was well known in England. Um, there's a little uh, 15th century poem. Eight is my true love. Do before nine, put there to five. So well it will beseem, 18 twice told, 20 between. <laughs> and if you're good with your numbers, you will get the name of Mr. Jesus. Um, and if you're not quite so good with your numbers, you might need to see the little bit of a help um, that this goes by the letters of the Absi. This letter stand in number. Um, and one of the reasons this was well known is that Gematria used to be taught at universities. It used to be a, quite a major cultural and well acknowledged thing. Um, and what time frame are we talking of? When when was it taught? Um, <coughs> 14th century, I think, or 15th century. Mm -hmm. It was they they spent I think 12 days were assigned on the syllabus to Gematria. Mm. Um, probably focusing on on the on the Bible, on New and Old Testament, Hebrew mm, and Greek. Sure. Um, but clearly this was a, a religious text and they were using it in English. Okay, so that's quite well established and that was easy to find. But this is the long code for English. Couldn't find it, it's not written down. Nowhere. <laughs> okay. And it ought to be there. There must be one. Hmm. What, are, what are we going to, I was looking for two years for this. Um, everywhere and it was very very frustrating so i knew it must exist and the 
the long code is kind of the primary code. It's the most more important of the two. Um, so kind of needed to follow a little trail of breadcrumbs. And I found a, online, there's a, there's a guy called Thomas Worrell, who's, um, who's a Freemason and says that the degree most closely associated with Camatria is uh, Knight of the Sun, 28th degree. Okay. Wow. And okay. I was not aware of that, but if you've seen some of my other work on Night of the Sun and Night of the Tree of the Sun, uh, then you know why I'm excited by that. Right. Mm. Yeah. And Albert Mackey, um, in his history, says mm. that it's a con near condensation of Rosicrucian doctrine, so it's really close to um, a Rosicrucian source. Mm. Good. And a third clue is Henry Cornelius Agrippa's three books of occult philosophy may be considered as a textbook of the old Rosicrucian philosophy. Mm. So kind of know where we need to look. Henry Cornelius Agrippa ad Metisheim, De Occulta Philosophia Libri Tres. Okay. Um, so we open up the book. And there on page 144 of book two, we find our long code for all the um, Latin script languages, European languages. Wow, you must have been uh, so excited to find that. I really was. I was on <laughs> cloud nine. It was, mm. you know, bingo time. Um, <laughs> bingo. Yeah. Hmm. And you see it goes up to Z at 500. And mm. then he realized that the I at 600 is actually J. It was a hard J sound. Mm. And at 700, it's a V sound. V, yeah. 800, it was high, as in Hieronymus or Jerusalem, mm, right. um, which got converted in English to a J. Uh, Geronimo, Geronimus, Jerome, mm. and Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And uh, Agrippa describes it as a, an aspirated kind of a, a J, but really that's kind of an obsolete letter in English because um, we just move straight from Hieronymus to Jerome. So yeah. I, whether I should be using that or not, I don't know, but I, I count that as that obsolete. And the HU or HV, he, you see there it's Vilamus and Gilamus which is William in, in English. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so H V H U is a W. Hmm. And there we have it. We've got the short code and the long code for English. Um, it's all we need to, to get going and looking at uh, the sonnets. So this is what I did. Um, I got sonnet one. Um, original spelling, 1609 edition, it's the only one we can use. Yep. Uh, line numbers are important. All the way through to 2,155, the last line. Uh, uh, Gematria values by the short code and the long code. And something extra. Uh, not stands for notaricum. And that is when you simply count the first letter of each word. Hmm. Okay, so I counted these in four different ways for each line. And looking down, straight away I noticed a pattern. The Nicaritan for the Notaricon for the long code, three, five, six, three, five, six. And ooh, short code, 86, 86. Hmm they shouldn't be related in any way but they are so maybe there's a bit of a pattern there maybe it's a grouping mm -hmm. join lines two to ten maybe there's something in there well there may be i still haven't found what it is but <laughs> clearly what, what, what i got suspicious just for clarity you're saying that by identifying the l not for second line but thereby beauty's mm. rose might never die and by identifying the s not for that same line 
you wouldn't see the yeah. but you wouldn't see the connection until you realised there's another line that has the same value in each of and it's and it's two and ten. Um, exactly. And okay, gotcha. So this this isn't random. It doesn't look random. No. And then. But does it repeat the in, first, the, in other sonnets would be the question, of course. Well, yeah, if you put the first and the last line together, they add to 555, five, five, oh, which is esoterically an important number. Mm -hmm. And if you put the ninth and the twelfth line together, they also do the same. So it looks like there's something going on here. These uh, Gamach and Atarican values don't seem to be random. They seem to be planned somehow. They seem to be communicating something. Hmm. I'm not really sure what it is, but you know, this has got aroused my curiosity. And there are a lot of other examples. Sonnet 98, there are two lines there, same rather idiosyncratic value paired. Sonnet 99, the next one, the first and last line, same value. But this and is then, not, but this is not repeating itself on the other side, on the short, on the S not. It's just, you're saying there are... No, it's, it's not. But, Alan, when you put in the Nectarican scores and you add together the ones for line 1384, 251 plus 2320 is... 2571. It's come up again. Hmm. And then you go back to Sonnet 98, and the last line, it comes again when you add the two Gamacha values, take away the one Metarican value, you get the same number. Hmm. There's something going on. And this, you want to find out what it is. And again, Sonnet 19, we've got a pairing in the Natarican and another pairing and another kind of pairing, 882, 288. Calendron. And put yeah. them together and there's a group and they total 888. Oh, what's going on? Something's going on. And this was what means that you get addicted you want to work out what it is and yes. you need to become numerically literate you need to try and understand what these numbers could possibly mean can you explain why you've highlighted the swift-footed hyphen in that um swift-footed yes uh, a hyphen creates a problem when you're counting the notaricon yeah, because do you count the first is it on the is answer? swift footed one word or right. is it two words? Sure. Is yeah. it S and F or is it only S? <clears throat> yeah. Um, and to get eight 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 zero, it's got to be one word. But to get that pair of two one oh six, it's got to be two words. And maybe it's both. Um, yeah. So there's great potential for complexity and intricacy and subtlety and also it makes it more confusing when you're trying to crack it as a code um, so i mean part of what i've been doing the last 30 years is like building up a dictionary i've got a it's a word document about 700 pages long now with all the numbers set out and all the things which i think refer to or connect with that individual number and mm. you know it's built up built up built up over the years and gradually i learn more things and i find connections and i go back and occasionally <laughs> things click and suddenly i get a eureka moment and i realize why they're doing what they're doing yeah i hope that um, uh, resource is available to you uh, right i mean you've done it digitally obviously because otherwise yeah. don't you find i mean i know i do all the time i'll i'll find some connection i go oh, oh i've seen that before where is it <laughs> what is yeah. it and um if i were better organized i would have it all literally immediately at my fingertips but i often spend half an hour 
trying to find what I found six or seven yeah. years ago. <laughs> well, the good thing about having it digital is you can search your documents exactly. and your spreadsheets and things, and you can find things of course, um, yeah. quite quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll just show you a very quick example of one thing which was successful. Just close this little section off. Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. So the beginning of the sonnets is arguably the first V of the dedication. And it comes out, Gematria, that total 4,529. And that really hits you on the head when you find the Omega. It's a very uh, final line of the very final sonnet, 4,000. That's great. Yeah, I would, I would always look for mm. that uh, because, as you know from the book that I sent you, Decoding mm. Shakespeare, it's all about that. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the Aleph Tau, yeah. the A O, the M O E I I A. Well, maybe it's all that, and it's all. It's literally, if there's one uh, thematic element that ties all of the codes together, it's always that. You'll always try to put in something about that to tell you, probably, really, the the most basic spiritual truth, right? That. Mm. The beginning and the end are the same <laughs> and in yeah. between it's just a play it's just a drama don't get too well <laughs> between there there is a middle point and in fact there are many middle points yes. depending on how you look at it too and they are also significant and sometimes they tie into the alpha and omega at the beginning and end it's an alpha mu omega sometimes mm. um, okay. and it's just amazing scope for um these patterns. Hmm. So what the hell does it mean? 4529? Any ideas? <laughs> no. Um, and I didn't have any. I found this three or four years ago. And then I I, I chucked this at you, I don't know, about a month ago, and, and <laughs> gave you two days to come up with a solution. And I don't think you did. Um, we need some help. Okay. Uh, bright idea from Mr. D, uh, fourth letter, and Mr. D has a key, um, which of course is 007. Um, his secret code, uh, nothing to do with James Bond. Um, and incidentally, this ties into his name because called John D, Gematria value 712, he changed his name, Dr. John D. And he therefore became 999, which is an incredibly significant esoteric number, which... Um, is that just, is that about. doctor spelt full doctor or DR? No, full doctor. Doctor as, as Gandhi a, gives you 999. Re, yeah, regular doctor. Mm. Um, That's the number we used to have to dial to for emergency, wasn't it, in England? And I always wondered well, as a kid, why did they make it the longest number to dial? Of course, kids today won't understand that because you just hit numbers. But <laughs> on the old dial, rotary dial telephone, <laughs> to, to, to say you were in trouble was the longest possible thing. You had to dial nine, nine, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Most people won't even know what we're talking about with that, but let's look up rotary dial phones. So 999, that's really 999, and what something rather miraculous happens. Mm -hmm. If you divide 7 by 999, mm -hmm. you get rather an interesting uh, decimal. Yes. 0 0.007, 007, yes. 007, 007, <laughs> to infinity. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's all because he's 999, Dr. John B. And that's, I think largely where 007 originates that's that really division. that's very yeah it's very good peter uh you know yeah. that i i'm partial to the inverse of the fine structure constant being that because it starts 007 2992 7007 007 it's a palindromic number as well and and since the fine structure constant is just about the most important number most important constant in mathematics i'm sure he was aware of it but anyway this this is again um, yeah this is again new information that you think wow 
Um, I mean, yours is actually purer because it's it's, it's a plain 007, yeah. 007, 007, 007. Yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. anyway, um, that's Mr. D's key. And what do we do? We use it. It's a bit of a cheat. But the only numbers, um, the only divisors of 4, 5, 2, 9 are 1 and 7. So 7 times 6, 4, 7 is 4, 5, 2, 9. And it doesn't have any other divisors. <clears throat> so what do we do? We add them up and we find 5,184. So um, <laughs> this needs a little bit of magic. Yes, it does, doesn't it? Does anybody, we, 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 anybody watching know what that is? Please comment. What does 5184 mean to you? I'd, I'd love to know. This isn't your question for the free T-shirt, by the way, although it, it would be a good one because uh, we always um, give away a, a shirt on the show. Uh, so I'm just ju I'm just jumping in here to ask people to stay stay tuned in and tell us. Do you have any idea what five one eight four might mean? If Peter's going to reveal it to us shortly, I'm sure. Yeah. So we we need a bit of um <laughs> bit of like Harry Potter magic here. We need some magic words in Latin, okay? okay. And so what's Dr. D going to come up with? Contractus ad punctum. Ah, yes. Ding! Ah. And we get 51.84, which is rather significant. What could that be? <laughs> as the slow angle of the Great Pyramid. Mm. And that is the alpha and the omega of Shakespeare's sonnets. Beginning and ending, mm. the going up and the coming down. Beautiful. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that's 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 a very very convincing piece of of work. You can't gainsay that. That's, uh, I mean, given that we know he's pointing to the pyramid all over the place, pointing to it on the on the title page, actually giving us the geographic coordinates. Then, given that he's giving us a by counting stanzas and lines and words and characters, <laughs> you've seen you've seen my presentation on that, the missing eye, and then yeah. and of course the 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 basic structure, of course, seventeen base going on up to one five three, and the one five three one five four balancing on top. He's, it's all pyramid, 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 all the time. That's that's what that's the message is. So we have to ask ourselves the question: Well, what on earth? Why are the, are the Masons and Rosicrucians and everybody else so fascinated by this monument that just stands there, saying, defying you? Look at me is what it's saying. Just look at me. <laughs> look at my yeah, shape. The, the, yeah, uh, and there must be mysteries still not revealed. I I'm so sure there are, there are. No, I think we've got more now. Pretty sure. You're boring, Alan. <laughs> 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 There's got to be. I am sure. I, I feel it in my bones. There's something there, you know. Yeah, um, of course. It hasn't revealed all its secrets yet. Oh, I know that. No. No. Um, That's brilliant. How, yeah. How much, it, you know, Shakespeare's lot knew about that, I don't know. Um, oh, my God. Well... I don't Did they have you... secret knowledge? Did they, you know, was there something tradition passed down in that Rosicrucians or whoever they were? Was there a, a tradition of things known that are not generally known? Oh, you, you're talking about the, the deeper hidden secrets of the pyramid, not just the general interest in sure. Freemasonic. Oh, pyramid, pyramidian, yeah. divine providence, I, etc. Uh, oh mm. yeah, well yes. <laughs> but they've got to be. How can you? Have, I, I think have, they've got to be. Yeah, come on. Yeah. Yeah, um, and that's you know that's so exciting. I, I just I'm just dying to and for discoveries to be made and for uh, yeah. The corollary of that is is if they did, and if they're playing this game with us, which they clearly are. Yeah. I and I often think of it just as that as a game. It's a it's a puzzle really treasure hunt it's a puzzle but it has but but it's so significant because it's 
a puzzle on the level of a scripture. No, it's just telling you ultimate truth. So whatever it is for us to find, it's in the works. There's no doubt about that. It's in the sonnets and it's in the works and they are connecting to each other. There's codes all over the place, as you well know. Yeah. Yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah, well and it seems to have been set up I don't know, on a, from on high, as a puzzle to engage so many people. And so many people have like, thought about the, the Shakespeare question and become involved in it. And it, it's not quite fully, uh, not really a human set up puzzle. It seems to, I don't know, <laughs> it's, there's, there's something to it. Um, beyond deeper level yeah. somehow mm. but uh, do you feel i mean i'll throw this open question and to everybody watching as well because some people say or believe in general that well you know i mean this is the old hackneyed argument what well, does it matter who wrote the works? We've got them. It doesn't matter, right? So I can't, sus I cannot subscribe to that in any way, shape, or form because it's, it's, it's just the, the very essence of what anyone writes is 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 is, is about. You you write about what you know, and 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 the idea that a life can be divorced from it. But I mean, but a lot of people have that thought. So throwing this open again I always like to try to engage our, our viewers and listeners and say what, what do you think so please comment on this I mean it, it, you know is is that do you think it's important to know a let's say just who the writer or writers were B is it important to delve deep into what they are hiding in these codes because to me, if you've put codes there and you don't intend them to be found, what's the point? What is the point at all? I mean, you, that's, uh, it's, it's like saying, well, I, no, I mean, I can't even, can't even think of a corollary. What's the point? If you've embedded it to make it a puzzle, the purpose is to find it. There's no other explanation. <laughs> but a lot of people have this idea that no, no, well, it's a, it's, you know, it doesn't matter. And it's a spiritual journey. And the truth is about, you know, about just finding yourself. Well, maybe you're supposed to be finding yourself through this knowledge that's been hidden anyway. Maybe that's part of that puzzle. Anyway, please carry on. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I think it's this. I think it's really important because whoever he was was a human, and it's a or human she. story. Or she, or they, um, <laughs> or they. But it's incredibly personal and it's incredibly powerful. And as a fellow human, I find it really interesting to know what this person went through, and I want to know more about them. Um, that this person has touched so many people around the world. And there's such depth of feeling in the sonnets and such knowledge of the world in the plays. And they've got to be like one of the most interesting people in the world. And we don't know bugger all about them. <laughs> and we want to know, you know, it is a mystery <clears throat> and to me. And I want to know more. I, I am really hooked. Really well, I think we know that, Peter. Anyone that would spend yeah. 30 years on something. I mean, I'm about to quit myself. I've done 16, 17. I, I think I'll, I think I'll, Good. Do, Good. I'll stop next year and take some time off. But um... <laughs> give me all your research, Alan. Just send it over. <laughs> fine. No, <worries>. <coughs> no, I mean you can't stop, can you? But no. here's an interesting question for you. Do you suspect when you got on the journey, when you first got your uh, SDs, your mm -hmm. STDs, um, when you first got, <laughs> that's what he called them, ladies and gentlemen. It is. It's a disease and there's no it's cure. <laughs> there, um, there's a, I'm, no, I'm there's stuffed. a cure. There is a cure. It's, it's, the cure is, is reaching 
the grail and going, ah, I got it, I'm home. Snakes and ladders, you know. Oh, I made it. Yeah, well, but, that's what we want. Yeah, that's what we need. But anyway, if you had known that it was going to take 32 years, right, would you have volunteered for the job? Uh, yes. Wow, that's a brave answer. I think I would, although <laughs> one, once everything has been found, I will give it up with a huge sigh of relief. <laughs> Oh, I don't know. Because... About, I don't know about that either. Car, you know, it's like um, the game's over. Now what do I do? Have I got to watch baseball? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> how about them Lakers? I, I don't even know what what sport it is they do. Is that is that rounders? Then they don't ask me. It's all American to me. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, I. I no, we're we're stuck. We're sunk. Let's face it. We've had it. I I, yeah. I mean I well I it's impossible to answer that. But if I think about it deeply enough, I would say the same thing. I'd say this is fascinating enough. I'm going to get into it. And it doesn't really matter how long it takes. But I will say that after a certain while, you tend to beginning. You start thinking. Ah, I wonder if I ever will have a life again. And does it matter? Because. You know, I like to make a joke about that, but honestly, it is, I'm sure you feel the same to me. It's the greatest joy and it's the greatest privilege to be even allowed to see into some of this wonderful hope diamond, you know, just that you look at it from any aspect and something, you know, wow, look at that. So, and I, but I'm finding more and more and more my thrill now is to just convey it, turn other people onto it and see other people get excited about it and let them take the baton, right? And, and carry on because no, it won't. If this is a divine work, which is utterly, I am, I mean, there's no doubt that it is, then I don't know. The Alpha and the Omega, when, when do we get to the Omega or the Alpha? I'm not sure we do, but it's the fun of the ride, isn't it? It's the thrill. It's the joy of discovery. Oh, my goodness. For a brief moment, you might think, wow, I'm the only person on the planet that knows this. I might be mad, of course, and I could be completely self-delusional. However, <laughs> that's, a, that's a nice feeling. It's like, oh, wait till mm, finds out about this, right? With you, it's yeah. probably your wife. Do you, do you have children? I don't know. You... Yeah, I've got two kids. Yeah? Yeah, um... One, one at university and one at one in secondary school. Um, yeah, they're, they're here and uh, oh, I, I do share Shakespeare with them from time to time. And Be careful there. Uh, I, I have one well, I daughter know. and um, yeah. she, after about 12 years, she said to me, Dad, I cannot talk about this anymore. Can we just talk about the weather? I mean, every time I come over, it's look what i found now i mean it's not that i'm callous or, or unfeeling i do want to know what's going on in her life occasionally but it's just... <laughs> see couldn't resist no i mean <laughs> I, I always was and always am interested but still it's always like oh you've got to see this and she just reached a point where she said no i don't have to i cannot i can't see it anymore else i will disown you Yes. Enough. Yeah. yeah. Enough, Dad. I, I understand. I understand that. And uh, my wife has said a few times, it's either Shakespeare or me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. And it's still I mean, Shakespeare, I, I totally, apparently. <laughs> I totally understand. And I, I do feel sorry for her. I do switch off the, the Shakespeare laptop oh you've got to time. no you, well you've got to if yeah. you have if you have, you have a, to if you have a life yes, yes. Mm, uh, yeah. But, uh, yeah of course you do um what's her name your wife rayhan rayhan get out now while you can she's asleep <laughs> it's half past two in the morning alan <laughs> <laughs> She won't forgive you. <laughs> well, I hope we meet someday. Yeah, All I'm, right. sure, I'm sure you will. Um, I'm sure you will. <clears throat> Would you tell us, um, I mean, I'm sure you've got more. I, I want you to show everybody what you 
first showed me and uh, the geometric things but let me just first do a question because uh, I want to throw open this question every as you know every podcast as everybody knows we give away a prize to see if you've been paying attention all right <clears throat> so if you haven't won anything in past podcasts or ever in your life um, you can <laughs> apply now, write the answer to the question that I'm going to ask you in the comments. And this is a bit of a tough one. This is uh, usually up until now, we've had fairly, fairly straightforward ones. Uh, we've had a couple that were so fairly straightforward and easy that we had ended up with a tie and, and, and we had to, you know, uh, give away two or three t-shirts. And we don't want to do that again. Um, <laughs> we, we do. We just want to spread the word. But we want to be fair. And, and so this, this one, I don't think it'll be that easy. But here's the question. Alejandro's got it ready to queue up. In what year did we learn a speed of light value more accurate than Shakespeare's? Go for it while Alejandro plays the Bard Code video. So first person to give us the right answer to that in the comments, we have operators standing by. <laughs> so we might have to be interrupted, but Peter, <clears throat> well, no, I won't interrupt you. Just go ahead, do what, do what you're going to show us okay. next. And then um, if, if at some point, once that's through, hopefully we'll have a winner and we'll announce. You can't win it, by the way, Peter. Well, no, I, there's no hope. That's an, Alan, that's an absolute stinker of a question. <laughs> I, I, I have absolutely no idea. Oh, no, so. you weren't paying attention, you see. It's always a question that something I've said earlier. Okay. <clears throat> oh, good. Yeah, this one. Uh, well, yeah, something. hopefully someone will be a bit more alert than I was. Anyway, this is um, uh, my look at... Um, something I think I have been successful in cracking, okay, and it's looking at the cover. This is the, obviously, 1609 first edition of the sonnets, and starting with the dedication, which 100,000 people have been racking their brains to try and decrypt and find out what's going on here, because it's so obviously... Um, one, two, three, four hidden messages, maybe 500 hidden messages. Um, so we're going to use the short code and the long code from Shakespeare's day. And we're going to do Notaricum short code, um, Gamachia short code, Notaricum long code, um, Gamachia long code. And we get a grand total of 17,524. Um, which looks like pretty much like a random number. And then we look, look, there's two words with hyphens in, um, ever living and well wishing. And uh, is that E or is that E and L? W or WW? So we do a completely separate count and we come out at 18,476. Not a random number. So the first version was counting it as one word? As one word, the yeah. Second version and is counting it as two words. Second, when it's in words. blue, it's counting it in two. Got it. And 
you put the two random numbers together, and it comes out at 36,000 exactly. Ah, that just stunned me the first time I saw it, and it's stunning me again. I mean, that yeah. that is, you know, that's... Because, and the, and the thing is, you, you've cracked the fact that it requires all four systems. And that's the all, thing that all always... All four systems, yeah, and two different ways of doing all yeah, four systems. Which is so D. Uh, yeah. I mean, it is so, you know, from my other work, that that's just, that's just it, right? The M-O-A-I-I-A-O-M thing of, oh, we've got to turn it around, be opposite, then spin it around. I mean, it's just nuts, right? But this is an exact yeah. mirror image of that, but in Gematria. And it just thrills me. And you end up with 36,000. It's not just the fact that it's a pure, clean number, but it has massive relevance itself mathematically. Go on, yeah. please. Yeah, is, yeah. And, and this is this is far from the end of it because um, we haven't counted that, and that's written in the biggest letters of all, TT, mm. um, which every academic will tell you. It's Mr. Thomas Fort, rather obscure publisher, blah, blah, blah. Don't know a lot about him, but you're like, was he a pirate? Mm -hmm. Did he write this <clears throat> himself? You know, and... yeah incredibly ignorant i'm sorry to say it but incredibly ignorant because this is a lot more than that yeah. hmm. we do the same counting method and we find out that the total for tt comes out at 476 hmm. and if we add 476 go. to the lower total we get 80 And if we take it from the higher total, we get yeah. 18,000. Exactly. You're fading again, Peter. I don't know why, but your voice is mm. it's like you've gone into okay. the out to the outhouse. So Have you gone to the outhouse? Where no. come on back, lad. We need to hear you. No. All right. <laughs> Did you well, see what he said, best. Sally? It adds up to eighteen thousand. It's got to be important, this. Who are I? And Switch that, the telly off. Watch this. It's bloody Come on, great. Alan. Come on, enough. <laughs> we'll get on with this or we'll be finished tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I want me tea. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm telling you, though, it's serious stuff, this Deirdre. Check this out. Yeah. 36,000. Yeah, what happened? Uh, <laughs> this 36,000 is separate, is independent of the other one because it's only arrived at virtue of TT. Yeah. yeah, it's brilliant. And it's not finished yet. Because if we add the 476 to both numbers, we get 36,952. No. Another completely random number. <laughs> or is it? <laughs> 36,952 is divisible by these numbers and only these numbers. And what do you think might happen if we were to add them up? Exactly. 72,000. Double 36,000, mm. four times 18,000. Mm -hmm. And that's all done by two letters, mm. T, T. Yeah. It's a Kabbalistic key. It's, mm. it's a master key. It's not some random publisher. <laughs> okay. um, I think I know why. I don't know. This is one one explanation um, for why those three numbers come up. Um, Thirty six thousand was a Platonic great year, Annus Platonicus, not necessarily the astrological great year. Mm. Um, I think there were a couple of other variants of the great year. And this was registered, it's recorded in a number of, of writings in like the medieval period and later. Um, and it's quite well referenced. And in Edmund Spencer's Fairy Queen, part one, the first edition, the line count was exactly 18,000. And Shit. Spencer was Shakespeare's immediate predecessor as a or contemporary, really, as a poet. Yeah. 
and a great inspiration for him. Yeah. And whatever esoteric system Shakespeare was using, it's very likely it would be similar to what Spencer was using. Sure. And the line total of 18,000 for part one implies a grand line total for the completed Fairy Queen in 12 books of 36,000 times two. And that comes from one of the most, or probably the most highly regarded academic who studied the numerology of literature in this period, Alistair Fowler, who is a very old gentleman of about 93 now, but in his time he was uh, Edinburgh University and extremely highly respected. Um, so it yeah. looks to me like these numbers are signifying the huge patterns of time. Oh, yeah. They may well be doing <clears throat> two things at the same time, but one of them seems to be following Spencer and pointing to these patterns of time. And um, th there is so much tied, tied into that, of course, and I don't want to steal your thunder if you're going there. Are, are you open to, are you asking for ideas? Or no, I, I, I would love you to <clears throat> enlighten me as to the further significance of these numbers are. Well, just 18 and 36 and 72 themselves are, uh, uh, you know, I mean, the, the pentagon is the pentagon and the pentagram, the angles of the pentagram, uh, isosceles triangles that form the pentagram, 72 degrees. Um, the 72 is the portion of uh, the one end of the grand yuga cycle uh, where if you were to hold out a hold your arm out at arm's length with a with a toothpick at a certain time to the sky if you could be accurate enough with it and next year do exactly the same thing, the, the background stars would have shifted about the width of that toothpick and it's literally, it's the, the you know, the, the commonly thought 25920 of, of everyone sort of cites as being the great year of the Yugas uh, is really the one polar end of it because we are close to the Dark Ages now and just coming out of the Dark Ages. When we are in the golden age, uh, the higher ages, that the Greeks would call, you know, the, the golden age, silver age, bronze age, iron age. Um, then where the planet is, or the whole solar system is closer to the magnetic center of a particular part of the galaxy that we're spinning around. So there's a lot of mathematical implications to that, but the 72 part is one end of it. It's also, again, John Dee's most f favorite um, uh, polygon symbol that people very, very mistakenly associate with Satanism, of course. Um, so there's that. If you add up the 72, the 36, and the 18, you get 126, and that's the irreg irregular sonnet that is so important, the envoy after the fair youth sonnets, the start of the dark lady sonnets, 126, which doesn't seem to go anywhere, and uh, you know, but uh, uh, changes its format. It's an eight. It's, it's, it's tetrameter instead of pentameter. It's 126, and that's the one with the two empty parentheses at the end, only 12 lines instead of 14. It's, it's highlighted as being obviously very, very significant. Um, and so there's all there's all of that, but the basic fact of it, it being the, the the multiples of 18 to 36 to 72, uh, I think the most significant is literally the basic geometry of of the pentagram because universally, um, well, uh, it was, it was <laughs> as you well know, the, the, as a silver star, 
that was part of Edward de Vere's heraldic emblem. It's also the five pointed star is, is two of them is in Bacon's heraldic emblem. Um, not saying here that that means oh that means they're the guys and they're the only ones. I'm you know what I'm, you know what I'm saying. I'm just simply saying it's so significant when I went to Stratford to scan the altar and before even scanning the altar and several trips there I, I went there uh, over a period of four years six times <clears throat> to 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 it's the wrong word to say ingratiate myself into them I mean it, it was the intention of course but then I grew to really like them and ultimately love what they're doing. I mean, they, they, it's not their fault. They don't think that they're hiding some secret and they're just trying to run a church, you know. But nevertheless, it's understandable that their whole fear would be, oh, don't rock the boat, because that's our livelihood, you know, Stratford, that's their livelihood. But it's not that they're in on something and, oh, we know very well that we are uh, definitely doing this thing of... of uh, <laughs> of of trying to bring about the downfall of your time. We're not doing that. All I'm saying is that it's very, very important that they know uh, that they've, they've got... that they're, they're not in on it as a, as it's a sort of a conspiracy. So, um, anyway, the numerology... Part of it is is all tied to that. And when I when I was there at the altar, I'm looking at the altar stone, and there's a five pointed silver star embedded into the side of of the altar. <clears throat> and um, and so all of it is saying the same thing. It's got this utter pure mathematical cogency to it. So just wanted to put that in there. Okay. Um... So let's let's move on now and have a little look at the um, the cover, um, and this was where you found all of those right angle triangles and the circle and the amazing constant constants, um, and we can apply the same um, Gematria analysis, um, and we notice there is actually one hyphen, which gives us two grand totals. Eight three nine six eight five zero four together, and we get a one six nine hundred, which is rather important. It's not just a hundred; it's also <laughs> it's reflected in the year, uh, same digits, and it's a square number. Hmm. Uh, one hundred and thirty squared is sixteen thousand nine hundred. So this doesn't look random to me. Not at all. Um, and even less random when we add it to the dedication total of 36,000, um, because they make a square number together, hmm. which is 230 squared. Hmm. And it's obviously connected to 130 squared. Um, so it seems to be part of a pattern. The cover page and the dedication seem to fit together rather nicely. Um, so what's this business? Why 130 and 230? Now, Alan, I don't think I've shown you this. I don't know if you know, if you have an inspired guess as to why those two numbers might fit together. 360, sexagesimal system, number of degrees in a circle. Well, that's a brilliant answer. It wasn't where I was going. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't win a t-shirt? Darn it. Well, you do win a T-shirt. You don't win two T-shirts. That's all. Uh, okay. Um, it, I well, I, I don't know. This is something I've I just I've worked out in the last few weeks, a couple of weeks. I think it refers to someone from the Bible, this Seth, mm. who was the third boy of Adam and Eve, mm. after Cain slew Abel. Um, yeah. They had Seth. And he was either born when Adam was 130 or 230. 
Well, Genesis is no. is ambiguous about that, or do yeah, they it give? Is. They it give... Is. Are you going to show it us? Is. Yeah, I'm going to show you too. Um, the main text that we use in uh, modern Bibles <clears> is a Masoretic text, and he was 130. But there is another canonical text called the Septuagint, which is the Greek version. And in the Septuagint, he was 230. So those two numbers relate to Seth. Hmm. Now, who was he? Well, he was only the founder of the Kabbalah <laughs> and the Hebrew version of Toph. Uh, so that looks kind of appropriate, really. Yeah, it does. Yeah. So I like it. But then they may both be um, interconnected anyway to the idea, because the sexagesimal system is the absolute perfect, uh, well, it's yeah. the perfect yeah, counting sure. system because it's joining five and six, ultimately, pentagon, hexagon, uh, the decimal system and the twelve system which have to be joined and it's a lot of Robert's work right now is all pulling all of that together but um, we have a musical system that's based on 12 we have a number system that's based on 10 um, there has to be a marriage of them uh, please carry on okay um, in Hebrew Seth is uh, Shin Tov uh, much of value 700 and when you're counting the dedication you actually make exactly 700 computations 700 items are added together um, you count the gematria um, 144 letters four times um, the tarikon if uh, the two versions of whether hyphens or not with hyphens it's either 28 words Mm. two words and then you got the two letters tt mm. counted by the short code long code mm. uh, by notaric and gematria grand total 700 exactly um so that would refer to seth um, in hebrew and also you might be interested to divide thirty six thousand by 700 and it's 51.43, which is also a pretty close analog for the slope angle of the Great Pyramid. Whether that's a coincidence, I don't know, um, but it's it's pretty close. Hmm. Uh, Toph is the scribe of the gods um, in ancient Egypt, responsible for writing in words and for counting all science, all magic, all wisdom. Um, incredibly important figure in uh, Egyptian uh, mythology symbolism, sacred science. Mm. His symbol obviously is the ibis, and in Greek, the ibis with the definite article is 230 in, in Gematria. And obviously, TT is Thomas Thorpe, shortened, abbreviated to Toth Thorpe. So it's looking like Seth, Toth, Thomas Thorpe. It's the master initiate, the master magician um, who is devising this, who is referred to. Yes. We've got a really, uh, I think something is happening with your internet connection. You're fading out more and more frequently, and it's obviously not you turning away from the mic, but it's, it's mm. uh, to give you an example of what it sounds like, it sounds like a grown mic, and then you're back again. I don't know if it's just what happens. I, 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 I don't know, I have no explanation for it, but I'm just saying it's a shame, and I wish we could fix it but i don't know if we have an answer for that and um, i'm only bringing it up because people are going right. to be 
a bit frustrated as I am not hearing exactly what you're saying. Um, I wonder if there's any way that you can hold on. Alejandro is trying to give me a message here. Okay. Okay, yeah, it's, it should be fine. People are saying it's, it's fine. Okay. Um, well, I'm not hearing it. <laughs> so, uh, are you hearing it that way, Alejandro? Fading out? Occasionally, but it's okay. It, it comes back. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to carry on anyway. Um, but let okay. um, and I don't. I did not mean to interrupt you, but I. I didn't want people to be missing it. And for sure, uh, it's been going on throughout the whole show. So we'll only know when we see the recording of it and know whether or not it translated that way on, on out onto Facebook. I hope it didn't, but certainly for me it's been frustrating because it just disappears and then comes back and it's getting more. So carry on with this and uh, and then we have an, an announcement to make about a winner. But take it to a suitable pausing point. I don't, I'm not asking you to stop, but I want to announce this winner okay. at the point when you are comfortable to Right. Um, okay, I'll just uh, just about speed up. Um, there, there are different ways of, of portraying that, and I'll just fly through those. No, you don't have to um, speed up. Please don't feel that. I'm um, just saying, uh, if there was a okay. pause place, I wanted to let the winner know that they'd won. But carry on. Okay, I will, I will stop in a few slides time just for a pause. Okay. okay. Um, there are there are different ways of obviously of, of showing this sort of graphically. Um, and really, it's just kind of pretty patterns, but but they're kind of valid patterns. Um, you've got 23,230, you've got 13,130, and then you've got 130 squared. So I don't think it necessarily means anything, but I just rather like that. Um, <laughs> more significant, um, if you put the square in the middle, obviously the the side lengths together make 360 um, degrees in a circle or uh, the angles of a square. Um, the total side lengths, 1,440. Minutes um, in a day. Big, big numbers. <laughs> Minutes yeah, in a day. Very, yeah. yeah. And so many other things as well. Mm. Um, really intentional. Well, especially um, since considering the science are really all about time. I mean, if there's one mm -hmm. cohesive theme, it's earthly time and heavenly time, ephemeral time, eternal time, <laughs> finite time, 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 time. So the yeah, idea that he's this. riffing on minutes in a day is interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so we've, we've put this the little square in, in the top, and now we're going to flip it out and we can actually make a triangle. Um, mm -hmm. And so this is Pythagoras theorem. Um, yeah. So we're going to add these two squares together mm -hmm. and get the square root. And <laughs> we find that that's going to be 264. Mm, 264. That uh, can't possibly be significant. I don't know where you're going with No, that. it's it's a random number, Alan. It's, it's <laughs> no importance at all. Um, but uh, I don't know how good you are at maths, uh, or math, as they say in America, um, no S. Uh, let's try and add them together, shall we? Yeah, Four, I might have an idea, yeah. Uh, six and three, nine. Um, 597? That's the one. Yeah, well done. Well done. Oh, well, you're wrong. Oh, <laughs> have I seen that before somewhere? <coughs> um, looks familiar. <laughs> Mm. Six, two, four, twenty-five, or six, two, four. No, I think this is just sheer luck, Peter. So thanks for coming on. We appreciate it. And um, that's that's dramatically wonderful. And I love that you've connected two, six, four to the 624 because I I haven't in any way other than just the palindromic or anagrammatic nature of the numbers 
as you mm. know, 264 in the first folio is the page that gives away the whole system, right? It's the page in yeah. Twelfth Night. No man must know, no man must know what follows. The number's altered, no man must know. And then you look over the next page, and it's page 273. The numbers have been mm. altered. Oh, maybe he's telling us something. MOAI doth sway my life. If this fall into thy hand, revolve. Be opposite. I mean, it's all there, and that's all on page 264, which is a deliberate clue in the whole thing. So that's brilliant. Absolutely. Yeah. Do, do you want to pause now, or should, should I go on a bit more? Sure, or? let's do a pause for a moment, and just to find out okay. who uh, we ha can celebrate. Well. <laughs> and we have, our winner is, Franklin Lavoy or Lavoie, or I, I would imagine it's Lavoy. You can tell us. So Franklin, send your inf uh, congratulations. Do you want to tell? Do you want to tell? I'm asking as though Franklin can speak. Do you want to tell us what the answer is, Franklin? <laughs> so the question was: In what year did we first have a more accurate? number for the speed of light than Shakespeare's. Shakespeare's was given to us in the sonnets in 1609 and Einstein was working with a number that was less accurate in 1905 only when Rosa and Dorsey got a better number in 1907 which is when Einstein published his theories began to. So well done Franklin go to the you know go to the do the thing <laughs> go to the store pick out a color a size a style and send us your information and uh, we will have a uh, a hawk fly a t-shirt to you as quickly as possible and if you do us a favor of actually perhaps taking a selfie with it on that would be nice i don't haven't we haven't been asking people that have we but uh, it's kind of nice just for our archives so congratulations very very pleased all right so um peter carry on please okay let's see if i can find the powerpoint again um, oh it's gone to the beginning now hmm. i'll get there in a second that's all right there we go, that's that one. Um, right, now we're back onto the trail of Seth and um, Because if we add 264 and 624, we get 888. And that is actually the value of Toph in Alexandrian Greek. And of course, Alexandria was where the library was. It's like the big esoteric center. So they seem to have... Uh, taken care to make sure that they spelt his name correctly. Um, mm. The original Greeks didn't spell it the same. It was just theta, omega, theta. But if you use a definite article, a micron, then it does come out the same. Um, so it seems that this is a number that we would associate with TOF. Yeah. And the Ibis as a hieroglyph was used as a shorthand for the number eight um, because in, it was also regarded as the eighth god in ancient Greece, uh, in ancient Egypt. Um, so there's a connection there. Eight seems to be his number. Um, so that seems significant. And very interesting that they the Great Pyramid is actually eight-sided, eight and that is also uh, commemorated in Sonnet 126 by shifting from pentameter to tetrameter. And and uh, and uh, I'm sorry, that's not that's not that sonnet. That's uh, uh, the other irregular sonnet. It's all right. right. I'm just having a, a senior moment. <laughs> so, as as you have pointed out, and actually many other people. Um, the dedication uh, does give us the numbers six, two, four, 
from the three these six lines two lines four lines there is actually another way of looking at it um, which is five lines three lines four lines and that is predicated by the spacing of the lines right uh, double spaced and then tight again mm. and there is actually a connection between those two numbers mm. apart from that referring to the three four five triangle mm -hmm. um, because six two four if you add together all the combinations of six and two and four they come out to 2664 and the individual digits add up to 12. Lo and behold, 534 does exactly the same thing. It has an identical pattern. And this kind of tells me that 2664, 264, 266 in the middle might be even more important. Hmm. It actually looks pretty cool because it's divisible by 111, 222, 333, 444, 666, 888. It's divisible by 36 and 37, which are both pretty important numbers. And that bit at the bottom will mean a lot to some people and not much to others, but um, I don't want to go into it, but that is quite significant. The 91 and the 19. Hmm are important prime numbers. Um, so that was interesting. And 2664 gives us a 345 triangle with a 666 and an 888 and a 1110, which looked interesting. A sort of canonical, very significant looking. Mm. And the area of the triangle is 111 times 24 or 111 times 2664. And of course, 2664 is 111 times 24. It's kind of interrelated and uh, this, this looks significant. Hmm. It's also the area of a square with a perimeter of 2175 which seems to be on the money because it's a gematria value of Shakespeare's sonnets never before imprinted. And <laughs> William Shakespeare times the golden ratio, 1.618. It's 1344 times 1.618. Um, mm. So I think this is intentional. I think this is you know, that there is deliberation in, in, in this. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's why we're seeing these numbers come up so often. Yeah. Well done, Peter. It is, it's, it's really remarkable, uh, the work you've done. Um, um, I must say, I, I'm just being bothered by this lack of sound. It's just getting worse. And so I'd, I would like to know if, uh, if we, on the technical side, if we know whether or not right. that's happening in Facebook. Oh, I wonder, is it any better now? Is it any better now? Well, it's not that. It's, I mean, it's not a question uh, of getting nearer. It, it, it's, it's that it fades out and fades out. And, but it's been getting... Mm -hmm steadily worse as though there were i mean I, I i i'm not the technical person to to get to it and we don't know but it's a shame if it's if it's actually coming out this way on 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 to everybody so anyway uh, bear with it um i think that we need to be uh i'd like to move on to just one other topic and then and then wrap it up um, unless you have something that you're that you've al that you're already on that you were, uh, where this was heading to 
No, I, I could go rambling on for hours, Alan. Oh, about that's it. all right. We both could. But, uh, it's not. Yes, I know. It's not that. I want. I. I want to. Um, I want to help promote what you are doing. So I want to ask a couple of questions about. I know that you don't want to talk particularly about Marlow, uh, um, but you are. I don't know if you would describe yourself essentially as solid Marlowian meaning you think he did it all or or what so and I don't know if you even want to go there but I'm going to ask the question just in case you feel like answering it uh, but but as for our listeners and viewers anyway um, where can they reach you and tell I, I'm not sure if Alejandro has been putting up a lower third with your address on he has right but so that's on um, so you'd you can say it anyway, just so uh, for uh, the yes. visually impaired people. I, I, I have a, a website um, of my own. It's uh, called shakescene.com, um, which is shake-scene.com. It's quite simple. If you go there, you can um, And is that the, the only one in a country? Uh, yes, it's the only shake scene in the country. Oh, yeah. okay. Good, because mm. I hate them to get to the wrong website. That's good. So it's the Yeah, well, they, they have to make sure they put the hyphen. <laughs> I know. Otherwise, <laughs> the hyphen is critical, Alan. Yes. Without the hyphen, it all falls to pieces. <laughs> Unless you use all four systems on it. Well, yes. I know. What is your forthcoming book called, and what is it about, and when can we expect? it and how do I get a free signed copy um, well you're going to have to wait until I finish <laughs> <laughs> because I, I did I, I originally I wrote this book about 16 years ago ah, and, I know the feeling um, <laughs> yeah and I, I put it oh. online and I, I, I sold you know a few copies of it from my website but it's seriously out of date and it needs to be updated. I've found so much more stuff since mm. then. Yeah, and I need to get round to finishing it off and it isn't finished off yet and it will be a, a while before it's ready um, because I've been writing some articles and things for trying to get things in academic journals and that's taken a lot of time. Um, so I don't have an immediate date that it's going to come out. But I'm, you know, kind okay. of ever hopeful, you know. All right. Maybe in the summer, but we'll see. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. All right. I understand that entirely. Um, uh, do you want to touch on at all the, I mean, I, I will just say this. Mm -hmm. I've resisted it hasn't really been a resistance it's not the, the quite the right word but um i you know we we all are down the mines doing our thing we're mining a certain vein of gold and that's what it is and so i have not been looking at marlow just as i had not been looking at bacon um but in the process of doing all of my work i would often find uh, codes about bacon that were clearly intentional uh, and so I would always put them aside and say all right well that's interesting I don't know where that fits uh, at the end of my that, that book you do have decoding Shakespeare I say I'm, I'm a non-Fordian I'm not uh, it's not that I'm an avid uh, paid up member Oxfordian who will never uh, view any other option because you can't I mean I did I don't um, anyway I just don't believe that anymore I did it perhaps at the beginning because that's that's how I got into it I was a, I was introduced to it by an, an avid Oxfordian but didn't it never it's never been that important to me that oh it must be this one person I think that's tremendously short-sighted viewpoint and now I'm seeing more and more and more that absolutely have a lot of a lot of stuff that absolutely unequivocally shows bacon and i've got a ton of stuff that unequivocally shows devere and i've got a ton of other stuff that shows many other people satellited around you know that were all part of certainly a, 
part of the nudge nudge wink wink when you told me about the Deptford situation that probably that's what most people have heard about Marlowe oh wasn't he killed in a in a in a in a tavern or a room somewhere and right um the one thing that convinced me without needing to even think about anything else was you just mentioned well he was killed supposedly by three thugs and under mysterious circumstances and then simply was never seen again and there's a lot of mysterious circumstances surrounding the, uh, the deposition and presumably I don't think there was an autopsy done he was just buried the next day in an unmarked grave so suspicious circumstances to say the least but when you happen to mention well isn't isn't that the Hiram Abiff story you know he's beaten up and killed by three thugs and he's and he's struck on the head he's killed actually supposedly killed with a knife to uh, above the right eye, uh, which I took great pains in the promotional video, you will notice, to have the hole in the record be right above his right eye, and the blood comes streaming down at the end. Very proud of that uh, artistic little touch. Um, so, <laughs> what are your thoughts on that? I mean, do you want to even go there? Because all I would say is that that has got me very very interested because that would make total sense if his murder was really a metaphor an, an initiatory rite of passage or whatever it might have been plus it facilitated him disappearing and not being uh, <laughs> uh, not having a, a date with the star chamber the next day and tortured to death which was apparently on the books for him so he had to get out of it somehow so anyway i'm completely open to it but i must say i haven't found you know unlike the bacon things where i found bacon codes and i've set them aside i had never found anything that led me to think marlow until i went to the one the the the, the one quote that I know of in Shakespeare that everybody understands is oh that's the clown touchstone talking about Marlowe all right strikes a man more dead than a great reckoning in a little room and so that's the only time that I've ever gone somewhere to actually search for it and I, immediately I found something that is I think very very uh, suspiciously well, I, I, I think it's, it's worth uh, looking at more. So what are your thoughts on that? Do you want to even talk about that? Or is that sort of... It's up to you. Do you want to give us yeah, a brief... Yeah. Um, the... Well, there are different aspects of it. There's like the esoteric side and the way that it was seems to have been possibly set up or possibly just adopted um, in Freemasonic ritual, um, the death, but there, there's also all of the, the motivation and the way it was set up and the sheer improbability of the different options that they just wanted to murder him or it was a mistake because so many things fell into place to allow it to be a faked murder. Hmm. I mean, one of the things which is probably not so widely known is that there was a corpse extremely convenient. Um, there was a Protestant, a Puritan um, separatist who fell foul of um, John Whitcliffe, the Archbishop of Canterbury, called John Penry, and he was um, executed the day before Marlowe's death two miles from Deptford. Mm. Um, that's a Thomas a watering at a very strange hour at 4 p.m., which is almost unheard of. Um, two other Protestant Puritan separatists, um, Barrow and Greenwood. Greenwood was a friend of Marlowe's at university. They were executed before at Tyburn, where most of these people were killed. Yeah. <clears throat> but... Um, Penry was executed 
two miles away, his family weren't notified, there was no evidence of where he was buried, and it seems like Marlowe and the three men were waiting all day in Deptford. They arrived at 10 o'clock in the morning and they were walking in the garden and talking in quiet sort until six in the evening. And it seems like they were waiting for a body. That's a, quite a logical supposition or they were setting it up. Mm. And then suddenly there was a very strange tale that they were eating uh, an evening meal. Marlowe was lying on a bed behind them. The three men were sitting at a bench with their back to him. And Marlowe suddenly argued about the reckoning, the sum of pence, a few pennies. And, and just for our people who don't know, the reckoning would be the bill. The bill, exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, and this became a key word in, in the inquest. And then Ingram Fraser, who was the, um, the right-hand man, the servant of Marlowe's patron, Thomas Walsingham, later Sir Thomas Walsingham. Um, he apparently um, had exchanged words with Marlowe um, and Marlowe apparently grabbed his dagger and hit him on the head twice. And Fraser then turned round stabbed him in the eye and he died immediately um, in self-defense. Mm -hmm. it, it's a very strange way of having a fight. It, it doesn't really seem probable, but it's the minimum required for a, a plea of self-defense um, because you need two witnesses. He had two little marks on his head, apparently caused by Marlowe and Instantly, Marlowe died. It, it, it's rather unlikely, apparently, from forensic testimony that that kind of wound would kill you immediately. Um, the great advantage is that it makes a mess of the face. It makes it difficult to recognize the face. If it wasn't his body, mm. um, and it wasn't, Deptford wasn't a town where Marlowe was known. It wasn't known that he ever. Uh, lived there or traveled there so the, mm. the local people who were called to the jury wouldn't necessarily know who he was right um, and also the coroner uh, was the queen's coroner um, William Danby who was a friend of Lord Burley's um, Lord Burley had protected Marlowe twice in the past um, once when it was rumored that he was going to a Catholic seminary to to um, go to the other side. And once when he was caught in the Low Countries, apparently coining, striking coins of the realm illegally, he was sent to Lord Burley, who let him go immediately for a capital punishment. Um, so uh, the coroner was a friend of Lord Burley's and he, um, by pure chance, was um, responsible for Deptford because the court was within 12 miles. The Queen's Court was, it's called In the Verge. It was, they were sort of living in that area. So he was able to take responsibility for it. And so it could have been a high level cover up. There's so many things that it could have, it looks like it was arranged to me. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I think he didn't die. I think it was right. a chance for him to escape. And then where did that where does that take us? Just to educate our listeners and watchers, I mean, you know, what would that be how would that be significant if he if this was a fake murder and he was just spirited away somewhere, we all presume mm. if that happened he would have gone to Italy, but Again, could you explain that for everyone so that they get a, a handle on why this might be a possibility? That well, he survived um, and, and then go to why he might be Shakespeare. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, obviously, Deptford is a port, it's on the River Thames, so it would be very easy to get on a boat and go to the continent. Mm. And 
Um, presumably there, there would have been contacts there would be somewhere for him to go to. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and uh, as everyone knows, Shakespeare seems to have known an awful lot about Northern Italy and been very concerned with it. So uh, that would kind of fit. Um, it has to be said, there is no direct trace of Marlowe afterwards as Marlowe. And I don't think anyone <clears throat> has presented a convincing case as to where exactly he might have been or how long he would have stayed in on the continent if he was doing this. <clears throat> um, how would he have sent plays to London? How would he have got feedback? How would he have helped them to be um, produced? Because yeah. a, a playwright would need to be involved in that, I think. Um, Unless. And that is, is a big unknown. Yeah. But that's taking the assumption that he's the only Shakespeare, you know. I mean, yeah. again, if it's a group of people who are all equally talented in different areas, uh, I mean, uh, the thing that go he has going for him is he's already the superlative writer of the age before Shakespeare. That's without exactly. doubt. And everyone says, had he lived, he would have become as great as Shakespeare, or maybe at least, uh, you know, you, that's all silly. I hate that. Sort of vague, mm. <laughs> vapid comparisons in art. But the point is, he was certainly, um, he could have been a contender if he... <laughs> you know, had survived. So the thought is, okay, fakes his death for whatever reason, goes away, writes, plays, or contributes, sends them back, and then others, they can to be mm. whoever, are probably doing the stuff around London. Uh, who, who knows? This is all total speculation, but just so that everybody gets a, a rough understanding. He's probably the most qualified that you know of to say, oh my God, this guy could write. And he was young and he was yeah. just a rising <clears throat> star. More than right, you know, he was it. And so, and then cut short in his prime. Plus he was a spy, plus he was involved with very shady people, plus he had very influential friends who could have secured this for him. So all of that kind of makes sense. Um, I would say the hard part is getting around what you just mentioned, what you alluded to, if he mm. was the only, he was the only person, that's a kind of a stretch to be able to say, well, he was operating from the continent and, you know, we don't know. But all I'm saying is that that side of it to me is is weaker than the rest but it's very convincing that he was all all of the setup was seemingly suspicious that it was absolutely paralleled to a Hiram Abiff initiatory Freemasonic uh, well metaphor for a death um, so I want to just I want to show everyone what I'd shown you because this was only the first time I never looked into it at all. I just thought, okay, I'm going to look at the one thing that um, is quoted always as, oh, here's Shakespeare making a reference about Marlowe. Maybe there's something there. So I'm going to go back to my, my keynote. I almost had a power failure. It's interesting. I only just saved, saved this. Mac has been plugged in all the time, and yet I turned to it a little while ago and had a panic attack. It was saying battery almost out, 1%. It was plugged in, so I'm now uh, having to find my way, my way back to where I need to go here. All right, so here's in... In the play, As You Like It, there's a scene in which this reference is made. So here's the cover page of As You Like It in the first folio. Starts at page 185. Now, you turn over the page, 186, 187, 188, 187, 
So 189 is missing. 190, 191, and it carries on as though nothing had happened. But 189 is conspicuously missing. There's all kinds of wrong number situations in the folio. This is one of them, where it carries on track. Sometimes the page is missing and it uh, is never caught up. It's as though, like, you know, it, it jumps a certain number and then continues from where it's jumped to. So there's all kinds of different codings going on. But this is one of those, it's just, it's just missing. And then you get 94, 195, 196, 197, 198. And of course, 198 is a convenient uh, sort of palindromic version of 189. And this is the page on which we have the famous saying. And it's this. Touchstone at 198 says his famous line referencing Marlowe's death. And here's the kicker for me. It is precisely 189 characters. And so when I see something like that, and then what are the chances of that? Why is page 189 missing? And the very quote that is saying something about Marlowe is 189 characters. So the clown says, when a man's verses cannot be understood, nor a man's good wit seconded with the forward child understanding. Now, when you see something like that, and I'm trying to sort of educate people out there to say, you know, because we can all find things like this. And if you feel the, the, the calling to go on a treasure hunt looking for clues, this is the sort of thing you look for. It doesn't particularly make sense. Merely, people will twist themselves into a pretzel trying to say what Shakespeare means, right? Oh, it means this. Oh. That. But honestly, on the face of it, that's a very tricky... Seconded with the forward child understanding? It might be, but he's just trying to put letters in, the pla in place. It strikes a man more dead than a great reckoning in a little room. Truly, I would the gods had made thee poetical. Had, spelt this way, never happens anywhere else like that. I mean, that's... To me, that's another, you, you look at that and you go, oh, this is trying to make a grid work. You know, it's, yeah. It's, if it, if it were a common thing all over the place that that happens, but it isn't. God's had made thee poetical. Okay, again, you know, you can drum up a, an idea and saying, well, he's just being a, a poet. But of course, it's, in, it's put into the, the mouth of Touchstone, who's... A clown, an allowed fool, his purpose is to spout rubbish and have truth hidden within it. So it doesn't really matter when it comes out of the mouth of the clown because that's that's almost free license to, to put anagrammatic and gridded codes in. So that's what it says. So obviously I'm going to put it into a grid and I always look for, is it a perfect grid? I mean... To be honest, the gravestone isn't, and the science dedication isn't. The monument is. So there are grids that aren't specifically a pure rectangle, but this one is, so that's another indicator. And there it is. Now, again, first thing that I look for is what's in the centre. I will find where truth is hid, though it were hid indeed within the centre, says Polonius in Hamlet, and that's always a, that's always a, you know, that's a, something that Alistair Fowler touches on uh, about we don't think this way anymore. But in those days, it was so important to be thinking about structure. It was as important, almost, as the content itself. Structure, architectural, mathematical. With the sonnets, it's a pyramid shape. In these grids, it's if it's a pure rectangle like this, look to the center. What's in the center? And right away, 
I see Veer. And obviously that's going to interest me. And I go, OK. But it's not really Veer. It's Vero with O-O-D. And again, how many times have I told you I've seen double O-D's signature all over the place? From on the gravestone, O-O-D in the shape of a 7 for O-07. It di displays a sense of humour. But, but the, I, I could show you 20 grids with, where he signed his name that way. And so here you've got, a, you've got it right in the dead centre, O-O-D and Vero. And Vero means truth. Vero and O-O-D is John T's double O seven signature. So I think I'm on the right track. I'm going, OK, well, we've got this mysterious number missing. It, you've got this is exactly that same number of characters. It fits into a pure, straightforward grid. And right dead centre, you've got that. What else is there? He likes putting rebuses into his codes, D does, and usually in, in the shape of a cross, which obviously would indicate you know, death or some sacred recognition. There's a cross. And going across that cross, underneath it, is it's in the word dead itself, but there's another E, strikes a man more dead. So you've got dead across a cross that says negative. Now you're going to say, Alan, it doesn't say negative. It says it's a W, not a V. But again, um, it, again, it takes the knowledge of how many times does this show up? I could show you dozens where the, the coding of W or double V is used in a grid to give you a special significance of usually oh there are two writers there are two Williams or there are multiple Williams William Shakespeare right the W is definitely a part of an encoding that is used over and over and over again it's so often it's just redundant and the using the double V and De Vere himself some uh, on, on occasion signed his name I, I am double V so a double V is a very clever way of indicating that, all right, there's even more hidden in that. Negative, yes, but it's the W is, has got its own inbuilt encoding. Well, negative dead is pretty clear. <laughs> it's not dead. But does it say anything else? Now, Peter, tell me the name of the three ruffians who were in the room with Barlow. Oh, excuse me. There was uh, Robert Poley, Poley, um, Nick Poley. Um, there was Skiers, and there was Fraser. Yeah. Good. Poley, Skiers, and Fraser. So I'm looking at the centre here, and I can <coughs> see Skiers like coming right out at me. Except that it's not quite complete. It's Skiers needs another e. But then I see the word lie and the other e, and I think, oh, well, there you go. <laughs> okay, a skier's lie. Poli, uh, well, I'm looking down at that poetical and I'm thinking, well, Poli is there. Now, that's homonymic because he doesn't spell it that way. It's P-O-L-E-Y, is it? Yeah. Yeah, but this it is, is P-O-L-I-E or, you know, you could say, I mean, it's certainly, it's pretty close. Poli. Then the letters that are not used must be used. I mean, that's just not, it's not that you can't ever say, oh, well, that's that because it contains the letters. It's got to make sense. That's a D trademark. But you've got the word it and is completes this line here. And in fact, it completes a perfectly balanced inverted cross. It is poly. Oh, okay. So you've got it is the poly skiers and then if you I, I, I this is not as perfect as some because you've got to use lie again but what what it's showing you is l i e lies and is i s above it and skiers they all have one duplicated letter the s s s it's S, S, S is part of skiers, is part of lies, is part of is. 
Well, that's not so random as it seems because the SSS is a Freemasonic. <laughs> um, well, we all know what it is, right? The triple S. Stiletto side solo alongside the triple tau in the gravestone. It's the tree of life in the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It's the it's the it's in Solomon's temple. And it has the additional meaning, and this is known, I'm not making this up, of the Freemason's vow. Silence, silence, silence. So it's kind of perfect. He's not dead. It is the Holy Skier's lies. Silence, silence, silence. There's more, but I just wanted to just put that out there to say, to me, if that was only the grid, I'd, I'd be partially thinking, well, uh, I'll have a look at it a bit more and see, is there something else that's really slam dunk? But to me, the thing that really locks it in is the fact that this is, you know, the 189 is missing. Why would you do that? And then have the very thing, the only thing that Shakespeare says about Marlowe be the missing number of the page. So your thoughts on that, Peter? Because to me, that's the first I've seen of anything. That, I mean, it's the first time I've even tried, but I just went to the obvious place, which is, oh, what does Shakespeare say about Marlowe? A yeah. great reckoning in a little room. Yeah, I, well, that's always been a... The whole play is, has always been of interest to Marlovians. And, um, <clears throat> the whole play of As You Like It? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, Why? But there are... Some, well, there are so many references which could apply to Marlowe. Um, there's the fact that Touchstone was going to get married by Sir Oliver Mar Text. Oh. Mar Text <clears throat> possibly speaks Oliver Mar, hmm. Mar or Marlowe. It's got mm -hmm. those those features in it, and it was going to marry Touchstone to Audrey. Um, hmm. But William was going to get in the way. It was like Shakespeare was going to get in the way, but Marlowe was going to unite the true gold to the audience. Uh, you see, since I haven't... It's going to be... Sorry. Yeah, I mean, this is all new to me. This is great, because I haven't been studying Marlowe. And as you say that, I would think, yeah, okay, that's the way... That's, that's, that's probably very significant, you know. So I, uh, I the, need to go there. <laughs> Study. It's a very for a Marvolian, a Marlovian. There's a there's a lot of interest in, in that play. There are, mm. um, there are other references too, which uh, we chase up. And, uh, okay. Yeah. I mean, there are references to Hero and Leander, which is um, obviously Marlowe's most famous poem. And within it, there are references which seem to be connected to to his death or apparent death. Oh, well, I was unaware of that. So good. I mean, again, because I just haven't been there, haven't been plowing in that field. Um, if you can turn me on to some, that would be be great. I, yeah. I, I, I think it's probably fertile ground. Um, but this one being the only obvious one I knew of, I went there and I thought, well, wow, there's that right away. I mean, it's probably something there, which who knows where that will lead, but it's <laughs> it's the puzzle, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> definitely. And it's one of the techniques which which you have found um, these these sort of square grids of just like one sonnet or one paragraph, and uh, your work with that. I, I haven't seen anyone do this. approach it from that angle and, and find these things. And, and clearly, this is one of the techniques that they were using. Um, oh, yeah. And there's no doubt. I mean, I, I've, I, because I've been working in seclusion all this time, and I'm only really now coming out and saying, OK, it's time to convey this and promote it. Um, <laughs> I mean, there, there are six two, there are, you know, the, obviously it started with the 624 code of the sonnets. Dedication, grave, stone, and monument, and the Enochian tables being 624 characters. Channel to D on June 24th, 1584, 
through June 25th to even possibly to June 26th. <clears throat> you know, and that was, I thought, well, that's, that's it. I found over a, a dozen 624 codes in critical places, in Green's Groats with the Wit, in Pallidus Tamia, in uh, the, the sonnet in the first folio by I M in uh, the first 17 lines of of Ben Johnson's right, eulogy where he can't start it right he just can't start it's just like it's false start false start false start for 17 lines then suddenly I will begin um, and they're all 624 characters even Milton's poem in the second folio, if you go by D's system of ignoring certain things, like he'll sometimes include all the punctuation. And I know that that gets iffy. People don't like that. Oh, well, you're saying that, you're saying that. It's like, oh, there's three sons, you know, come on. <laughs> no, there's, re there's method in it, in the madness. And the reason I know it, that it's method in it, is because it's not just, oh, I've decided to only look at what I want to see there and go. There's always another corroborating piece, such as what I just showed there, the number 189 page being missing. If that wasn't there, you'd have nothing really solid to hang it on. But since they go hand in hand, that's very strong evidence that this is intentional, right? Uh, particularly with the wrong pages in the first folio. They're all over the place, right? So, um, do you have anything you want to uh, wrap us up with? Because uh, I really I want to turn people on to... I hope people have been excited by what you've seen, what they've seen. I, I am very much. So... Yeah, um... All, all, all I would say is that I hope, you know, I have been able to show that I have found the or a very major um, gematria key to the sonnets. Yeah. And with that key, um, I believe I can show Marlowe's presence in the sonnets. Um, mm. Same key, looking in the right places. Uh, I think that helps to will help to confirm what I've found and to validate it. And I very much hope that you know I can I can get a book out maybe in the next year, and to show the Marlovian case to go alongside because we're a small minority compared to like Oxford and, and Bacon. Um, there are far more people on kind of your side of the fence and. I really want to put forward a strong argument for Marlowe. And I, I think now I'm in the position to do that. I just got to, you know, get off my butt and finish the book and, <laughs> you know, get it out there. <laughs> mm. Yeah. So that's that's all where I'd like to leave it, you know, at the moment. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, yeah. Uh, don't be too sure that it's just a side of a fence. I, I, I'm not. Uh, I, I, I'm. Uh, I'm part of what I'm trying to do here is to show people, open people's minds to the possibility that this is far bigger than we imagine. And uh, all I'm looking for is the truth. So I'm happy to expose en anyone's work uh, so long as it's convincingly obvious that it's well researched and well done. Uh, and yours is, it's, it's absolutely astounding. What, what you've just shown us today, particularly concerning the gematria of the, the dedication, uh, uh, I think it, that's just, that's just absolutely slam dunk. Um, and then as it goes deeper into the geometry, there's other speculative ideas about thoth, etc., etc. And I'm not, I'm not meaning that in a deriding way at all. I'm just saying, if I were to pin my uh, thoughts onto it. So what you've got is uh, utterly, absolutely, to me there's no doubt at all that, that what you've shown is 
completely intentional and genuine and goes very, very, very deep. And whether it ultimately shows Marla's presence, that's up to you to give, give us the information on that and we look forward to it. I'm not at all close to it. I'm completely open to it, you know that. Um, I just I just want the world to get excited about finding certain places where there is there is information that we could go there right now and find out. You know, the altar is one. <laughs> uh, that's what we need. I mean, the, all the research is it's all. Without the research, we wouldn't have anywhere to go to look at anyway. But mostly, what's going to get the paradigm to shift and change is finding something. Finding Absolutely, something Alan. physical. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, it's because, just another yeah. hundred years of speculation. And not that that's been a waste of time. There's so much work been done. Peter Dawkins is a good friend. And I'm at, he's on the next podcast, actually. Number 12 in two weeks' time. And so I want to tell people to pay attention to that uh, to that date we're actually probably going to have to do it in two shorter versions actually due to certain uh, certain other pre pre-existing conditions oh that sounds like a medical case doesn't it um but um <laughs> 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 there. am i covered i've got a pre-existing condition on that day for broadcast now uh i uh That's the goal, you see. Um, all the research in the world is going to carry on, and it must, it must, it must. And without it, we wouldn't be where we are today. And we all stand on the sh on the shoulders of giants before us who've all done magnificent work. Uh, my thrust is to try to go to where I've, I've found information that says there is something here. You know, so it started with the altar, but there's a couple of others that I'm going to be revealing uh, very shortly. So, Peter, I I am just delighted. I I'm so uh, glad. First of all, that we became friends. I'm so glad that you did indeed write write that little nudge of a comment <clears throat> that got us to be uh, communicating on a, this deeper level. Because now I got the opportunity to show it to everybody and say, look. It's even greater than we imagined. It really is, you know. It's kind of nuts, you know. How how all that happens, how the how Dee knew this and the actual writers. I do I, by the way, I do not believe Dee was one of the writers. I, I I'm not going there at all. I just don't think that was his his uh, job. He's undoubtedly the mastermind behind the encryptions. So, uh, anyway, thank you Thank you. Oh, thank you, Alan. Thank you so much. It's, it's fantastic to have the chance to come on your show and to share work with you and to, and to bounce ideas off you and to, uh, mm. you know, to have a fellow traveller, really, to in exploring this amazing yeah. phenomenon. You know, My it's pleasure. still a long way to go, but thank you, yeah. Thank oh, you. goodness, yeah. So everyone, please uh, go check out Peter's website support him shake scene shake hyphen scene hyphen dot com, scene dot com. Uh, and we look forward to news of the book so like you said i'm just really repeating what you said get off your ass and do it okay <laughs> uh, for all our benefits <laughs> thank you so much i'm going to wrap it okay. up now with a little um and just tell you what is coming um from i just mentioned that uh, peter dawkins will be my next guest and we're probably gonna have to do it in two two outings because peter <laughs> this peter that we just witnessed has been at it twice as long as i have so kudos you know I know what it feels like to do 16 to 17 years 
work of complete obsessive compulsive behavior to say I've got to get to the root of this he's done 32 Peter Dawkins in two weeks time has been on the bacon uh, trail for 50 years <laughs> yeah he's the world's least <coughs> excuse me he's the world's leading expert on all things bacon and I'm very honored to be able to have him on. And I want to just show you, uh, remember last, well, two weeks ago? No, it was three weeks ago now. We had a holiday in between, didn't we? Happy holiday, everybody. Happy New Year. I urged you to think different. You know, like that old Apple uh, ad campaign. Think different. I'd created my own about think deverent. This year is is going to be a year where we have to think differently about everything. I mean, not just the idea that we are where we are in this this story, but in our daily lives. Um, COVID has changed everything for everyone. It's a great challenge, but there are possibilities as well. I'm not minimizing the, the terrible toll that it's taken on people's lives who have been, that have been shattered. But at the same time, we just have to look towards the, the, what can we take from this? Where can we go into the, to the future? One of the things that this has in a strange way um, helped is this. We're all now used to, to Zoom, uh, distance is not the problem that we used to think it would be. Oh, I've got to get together with so-and-so. And we might not have thought about, well, we'll just do a Zoom call. <laughs> and now it's just, this is the only way, right? And that means you can get people together for conferences that you couldn't get together before. And you can get information as more and more people get facile with this as a, as a tool, as a device for communication. And we get better at building our communication skills through it. Um, the opportunities, of course, open up. So we all hope that this year brings relief from this strange period. But at the same time, uh, everything is plowing ahead here at Bard Code and Bard Cast. So I want to just tell you that the one thing that is coming that is uh, I am so excited about King James Bible, I've introduced the thought of this before a little bit. I'm going to be talking about it with Peter Dawkins. The Psalms, all everybody knows is that this, this is a known thing. Psalm 46, why does it have 46 words from the beginning is shake, 46 words from the end is spear. What's going on there? And that's about as far as anyone has take, taken it, as far as I know. Uh, well, I've just been down that rabbit hole for, I don't know, it's not been very long considering what, well, you know, other projects were, I've been down a rabbit hole for six months or a year. Um, so there's been a couple of months. I am going to be revealing to you through the podcast and specifically probably through the second podcast with Peter Dawkins because of certain way we've got to do it that the King James Bible was absolutely there is no doubt at all it's not even arguable and I'm not normally that adamant and strong in my convictions about saying no 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 this isn't this this is beyond argument it is it is a Rosicrucian endeavor. It was done by these people. <laughs> um, now, how much of it? Don't know. It's a huge undertaking. But the core engineers and architects of particularly, and again, it's the title page, the title page of King James Bible, 
is a minefield of Rosicrucian codes and some of the most beautiful stuff I've ever, ever seen. And so we're going to be talking about that and revealing it and actually introducing you to it, first of all, through the podcast. And I will say this, it's far more than just that. We have to think differently about it. Think different. Oh, well, that's my old ad campaign. But what I'm really trying to say here is it's this whole group, you know, it's the whole idea that clearly and these people have put their signatures on it. John D. Bacon, Devere. I haven't found Marlowe's signature on it yet, but that's not a, that's, that's just simply, I'm just simply saying I don't. I've only been in it two months yet. I'm quite open to the fact that he might have been involved in that too. But what we're going to show you is going to be um, paradigm shifting. Because it doesn't just involve the King James Bible. It's tied in with the whole epic, broad stroke story of what Rosicrucianism and then later Freemasonry and probably prior Templars was all about, about Solomon's Temple and the Ark of the Covenant. And if that sounds like a little bit of, you know, wild Dan Brown territory, buckle up. Tune in. Barred out. I'll see you in two weeks' time. Thank you so much, Peter. And God bless us all. See you soon.